is fresh out of Zummy Drops. <laughs> well, repopulate, people. We need you. From the Chris Wessling Podcast Studio, it's Around the NFL. I am Dan Hansis. I have heroes here. Greg Rosenthal, Mark Sessler. It is the flagship show, Sunday night edition, week four. And an interesting week it was, gentlemen. It's Woodshed Week in the NFL. I remember like we used to try to come up with themes, or, or NFL primetime would do that. It's like, it's comeback week. It's crazy this Got week. jacked up. And I'm just looking at the, the scores here, and it was a lot of teams taking to the Woodshed. Oh, Woodshed Week. A lot week. of teams taking to the I woodshed. like that, Woodshed I, Week. I, I, I've been scanning like the, like the last couple minutes, like the last three weeks prior, and there have been a surplus of blowouts. What about the boat race regalia? I like that. Yeah. Maybe we were due for a correction because all last season, all we ever heard, I, how it was the closest margin of error in NFL history, the most close games in NFL history. And the NFL was really pumping that up. I was thinking, like, isn't that just kind of a little random? It's, yeah, it's random. I don't know. It seemed it seemed like every game. <laughs> just though. saying. But even this week, but, you have games that, like, end up, like, you think they're over, and it's like, no, they're not. But it's, they, you know, were destined to go a fifth quarter on – Two or three of these every week. This guy gets it. I would, Mark. I would like to get going with the show because we got a bunch of games to get to. But Mark, but Greg had Woodshed Week. I had the Boat Race for Gallia. Uh, bomb Drop Sunday Part Four. Okay. Very Mark answer. Bomb <laughs> Drop Sunday Part Four. <laughs> By the way, we might have to <laughs> drop a bomb behind the glass. Can we bring in Eric real quick? You know. We love Roberts. What did he What's do? What's up? What's Robert, up? Robert, he does unbelievable work behind the glass. I glass. try. But I did. There were some snitches out there on uh, Twitter that uh, over the past week that let me know that there were no bongos in week three. Ooh. No bongos you in You said three. you want to get to the show and you <laughs> dropped this bomb right away. Well, this is important. Yeah. I don't know how much of a curtain we want to pull back, but we had to do a little reset last week and it was intended for the Dolphins. Oh. Threw me off my game. It was the first highlight of the show. I was thrown off. I will take the L on that one. You know what? I'm sorry. Not necessary. It's just important. If this show doesn't have bongos, it has no need to exist. I know. So this makes this is one of the most important bongo shows in the history of the Sunday flagship show. Who gets double bongos, essentially? You get credited for two bongos. <laughs> Got to get it right. It's like skins okay. competition in golf. All right. Let's get to the action. Let's start with the game that everyone had circled, the game uh, with the Supposedly unstoppable Dolphins offense heading to Orchard Park to take on ooh, Eric Roberts' Buffalo Bills. Would the Bills be ready to play? Oh, yes, they were. First play oh, of the yes, fourth quarter. Were. Three receivers left. DJ. Cook in the backfield to the right of Allen. The shotgun. Handoff fakes to Cook. It's a keeper by Allen, and he's going to sail into the end zone. An 11-yard touchdown run on the quarterback keeper. Oh, the Bills running away now, up 27 with an extra point pending. Oh, oh, Maron. You know, that was with 14 minutes to play in the fourth quarter. Humble pie for the Dolphins. Uh, Served up by Josh Allen, who threw four touchdown passes and ran for a score. And the Bills hand Miami its first loss, a 48-20 win uh, in front of a delirious sold-out crowd there in western New York. Greggy, uh, this was the first overall pick in our draft on Thursday for a reason. It's the game everybody wanted to see. How come it turned into a one-sided blowout? Sometimes blowouts are entertaining, and a team like the Bills put on a show, and you can have your 70-point offense, and you can have all the fastest players in the league, according to next-gen stats, but there's only one Josh Allen. That's it. It's one of the all-time Josh Allen games. Mm. I just thought the way he started this game on the very first drive, there was a play where Vic Fangio calls a blitz and it was a perfectly timed blitz free rusher uh, off the edge. And Allen just backpedals, backpedals, backpedals as if it's not even there. And he hits an opposite hash throw to Stefan Diggs for the first down 17 yards. Like it was nothing. I was like, wow, that, that's an amazing play. Has a dart for a touchdown later. Uh, fast forward a couple drives. They've already scored two touchdowns. Their first two drives. His ability to scramble and just continue to buy time, buy time, buy time in the pocket before finding Diggs uh, for Diggs's first touchdown. Diggs ends up going six for 120 and three. To me, it was just like money performance. It was just like Josh Allen in a nutshell. He can beat you in structure. He can beat you out of structure. He had four passing touchdowns, only four incompletions. Everything 
was great about Josh Allen's performance, even that rushing touchdown, just like the decision making and the way that he made this Dolphins defense, which has been disappointing in general, I would say through three weeks, almost embarrassed uh, 48 points, as you heard through about three quarters in a minute. It's kind of crazy where we were like a fortnight ago uh, or, you know, two weeks ago with Josh Allen. A A lot of the talk was, where is Josh Allen that we knew? Like, he's up and down. You're going to get the good version, the bad version. That Jets game soiled everyone's impression of him. He has been absolutely pristine for three weeks in a row. But I am just as impressed with their defense because, you know, I, I also feel this brushback against the Dolphins now where, like, last week is, like, this aberration. Like, they're still, they're still like, a centerpiece in the AFC to me. Um, they've, had the, they've lost three straight to the Bills. They've had their problems. But you take away a chance 55-yard run, they were completely bottled up on the ground for the most part. And I'm really concerned at times about the back end of their defense and what happened to them today. And I think there's this thing with Tua where it's like, I don't always want to question Tua because he's been awesome. But it's kind of like this was a game where he seemed a little less comfortable about like getting the ball out immediately to his first read. And like, if you cause some problems there, like, I don't know, this thing, this operation did not work. It's the way I, if someone told me the score might be reversed, like a, a couple of days ago, I'd have been like, the Dolphins will be the absolute talk of pro football. And instead, it's a massive comeback down to earth game. And I think that's why it's okay to take some air out of the balloon here. Because as impressive as destroying a bad Denver team is and a middling Patriots team, and they nice win against the Chargers in week one on the road, here's like a real test. This is the one where it's like, okay. Uh, and it doesn't mean they can't get off the mat. But you, you want to see the Dolphins go up to Buffalo and really, if not win, like put up a, a fight. And Greg, like you know, this is a game I'm looking forward to watching um, in full. But the the defense it has been covered over, obviously, because the offense has been so great. Vic Fangio defenses are known to take time to come together. So just a reminder, like when the offense isn't clicking, and it hasn't been full clicking for two games here. Um, out of four and the other two have been out of this world that the defense is going to have to make strides or they're going to have these bumps in the road along the way. Right. I mean, the, the bills scored a touchdown on virtually every possession until, until the start, until like mm. their, their eighth uh, drive or ninth drive in the middle of the fourth quarter. But the bills defense made more plays. I thought Tua played a strong game overall, but they did some things to disrupt the timing. A- as you mentioned, to send, aggressively rushers after Tua and sort of not worry so much. Very different than the Patriots, who I think the Patriots were in total prevent mode. Let's just not let them score 70 on us. The Bills came after them, and it worked sometimes, and it didn't work others. And and I think Tua actually played pretty well. But Terrell Bernard's making plays week after week. Oh, he was great last week. He, he prevented... Uh, Tua going to his first read on one play that ended up being, I believe that was his interception or, or maybe it was a fumble. Uh, Greg Rousseau, Daquan Jones, Leonard Floyd. Sean McDermott's different than Leslie Frazier. He is coming after defenses. They've been very aggressive. And it was it was impressive today. They're better up front on both sides of the ball, I think, this year than they've ever been, which is scary under McDermott. Their offensive line also playing well. And I know the rushing yards don't stand out, but in short yard situations, they're now just handing the ball off or in the red zone and they're getting touchdowns or they're getting first downs with their running back. Yeah, with Allen playing at this level the last three weeks, and you could argue he's playing better than any quarterback in the league after that ugly week one against the Jets, the Bills start to look terrifying. Uh, Mike McDaniel, Dolphins coach, we never can get him in the show. We we will. Oh, you have to. It's just fun to hear him talk. He's just one of those dudes. Uh, he was handing out flowers to the opponent after the loss. First off, I think um, the Buffalo Bills proved why they um, are are the, the the team that, you know, the, our whole division is trying to beat. They've, you know, won it for how many years in a row now? <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. Many. I think it's been three, maybe four years in a row. Uh, not all good news, guys, before we um, move on. Tredavious White, a very important piece of that secondary for Buffalo, kind of a heart heart and soul piece of the defense, suffers what appears to be a serious Achilles injury. Uh, let's hear from Sean McDermott, who did not paint an optimistic picture. Um, they're obviously still evaluating. Um, yeah, I mean, he's been through a lot. And um, sometimes you wonder, right? Um why things like that happen twice, you know, you know, to, to someone, I'm not saying what it is, what it is. I'm just saying like, um, you know, you just, you just wonder why, 
mm. um, because you watch him how hard he's worked to give back. Uh, it, was, it was really disappointing. He was he's just so frustrated, distraught, slammed his helmet, threw, threw his helmet immediately, pounded his fist against the ground. You kind of knew. And as great as this performance was by the Bills, I still left the game thinking the most important part of the game was they lost Tredavious White. Looks like it's going to be Achilles for the season. And Teron Armstead, the left tackle for the Dolphins, could barely walk off the field and left with a knee injury. Those are two of the linchpins of both of those two teams. And I don't think it was a coincidence that Miami's offense kind of started falling apart the minute Armstead left. So both those injuries. That happened asked. last year when Armstead was not in there. Like their splits, the way they looked, completely different. Uh, one other note, Tamar Hamlin was active in this game um, after his near-death experience on the field last year. His first time being active for the Bills. He played mostly special teams with Jordan Poyer, Poyer out of the lineup. So that is a cool thing. So all around, other than the Tredavious White injury, um, great stuff for Buffalo. Now 3-1. and one. Tied with the Dolphins atop the AFC East. Let us keep moving, gentlemen. Let us head to Indy. I call this the Frisky Bowl. Ooh. Rams, Colts, two of the most fun teams to watch so far this year. And nobody was talking about these teams in that way on September 1st. And that's why football's fun. Let's get to it. Stafford ready calls for the snap. Here comes the rush. He throws right side alone. It's Puka at the five. Oh, to the end zone. A walk-off winner. Puka Nakua in overtime. Nakua Matata. It means no worries for the rest of today. Oh, I love it. It's a problem-free Rams victory. <laughs> Whoa, JB. He's going the, going the distance with that. Oh, yeah. There we go. Everybody's on fire, including Eric Roberts behind the glass. Love this. Is this JB Long going into his John Sterling era? He's just gonna have like, catchphrases for everybody. I sounds it. like it. Unbelievable finish for the LA Rams. I find these uh, types of wins to be the best types. When you have the game in hand, you let it all slip away, and then you recover and somehow find a way. And that's what Matthew Stafford and the Rams did in a overtime victory over the Colts on the road, final score 29-23 when Stafford connected uh, to Puka Nakua, who's a star uh, in overtime coverage bust there. Tough tough beat for the Colts D in that spot. Um, this was a game that the Rams were up 23-zip, uh, I believe, in the third quarter. And then uh, what made this such a fun game, boys, is you saw everything that's kind of Exciting about this Rams team, how functional the offense is, how good, straight up good this offense is when Matthew Stafford is healthy and protected and Sean McVay is calling the plays. Like, and, and it's just like everything kind of works. And, uh, and then you saw what happens, why people are excited about this Colts team because Anthony Richardson then took over and led the team on three scoring drives uh, to tie the game up late in regulation. And, uh, what Kept hitting the two as well, Kept like with great two. play calls. Uh, it was just so impressive. He is such a great playmaker, Richardson, already one of the best playmakers in the league. And, and Mark, the Matthew Stafford, who um, I think we all like him a lot and, and respect him, and, and he's kind of had a great career, got the ring, and now this is kind of the epilogue and what's been a long run. He bangs up his hip late in this game. He could barely move, and yet he leads that team in overtime uh, culminating with the Nakua touchdown pass. What a huge win for the Rams on the road. Yeah, the hip injury, um, concerning, obviously. He's had hip issues in years past. Mm -hmm. um, he's of the age where, you know, we saw what happened to him last year. The body started to deconstruct as the season went along. And it's like, you know, I spent this whole offseason suspicious of why the Rams um, had this immensely young offense with Matthew Stafford sitting in there. Like, it felt a little disjointed, but not now. It's like... They, I have to give Sean McVay, like, and Les Snead and the whole situation, like, a lot of credit because a guy like Puka Nakua, who sounded like a, so, a name you'd make up, like, a couple months ago to, to non-college fans, um, 39 catches, the best start by any rookie in NFL history. Uh, they seemed like when Cooper Cup was lost that the whole operation was going to sink, and you might have a Rams team that wins three games. And I pointed to another team in Pittsburgh saying, look at how they're, 
putting an offense together that are all young together and growing. And they're a lost ship, but it's the Rams all along that like mm. had these young guys who are the opposite of household names a month ago. And they're really fun to watch. And it's like this kind of, to your point, Dan, like to get into a hole where you get, you've kind of given up your lead and it could break certain teams and certain other coach, teams that aren't coached to this degree. And without a Matthew Stafford under center, like, they didn't, I mean, they almost lost it, but it's like, I'm so impressed they didn't get stuck in that hole. I'm glad you said that because, Mark, I was texting with uh, Jordan Rodriguez, our friend at the Athletic who yeah. covers the Rams. I texted her when they were up 23 zip, and then, or she texted me uh, and reminded me of something we had some fun with uh, over the summer, the T-shirt that Sean McVay had uh, printed up, and it said on the back, and yes, it was wordy, and some of the syntax was a little... Shaky. Capitalization was weird. Yeah, some of that. There was an ampersand involved and an Some and. grammatical problems. But uh, the, the most important thing was the message. Mentally and physically tough players who are smart and love to compete. Watch that game. There's the T-shirt if you're watching this on YouTube. Watch that game and tell me that does not describe, Greggy, uh, the, the Rams team that we watched here. In it, You don't want to overrate a, a week four win. They got the, the Eagles coming in next week. But... To me, when the Colts got the ball back and the Rams had given up a 23 to nothing lead and the and the Rams had also just given the ball back with under two minutes to go, had chosen not to uh, go for it on, on fourth down or, or anything. And Anthony Richardson gets the ball back. I'm thinking like this Rams season is on the brink a little bit right here. If they give up a 23 point lead and they got the Eagles coming in next week and there's already talk in Los Angeles among reporters that that you believe like Jordan that like okay if if they get to the trade deadline and the you know they'll have decisions to make if their record sideways and there's a nice throw by Richardson on third down that Quinton Lake you know breaks up and it looked like he had gotten beat on the play he fights back to it Uh, they get into overtime they have that terrific offensive drive and they they can survive and get through this quarter two and two and even if they lose to the Eagles they'll have a chance to win some games after and it's like that's how you stack a season up is like surviving moments like that and and getting to a point where they won't be sellers at the trade deadline. Can I ask you a question, Dang? It's like I mm. I I watched as much as I could of this, especially just when it started to turn into what it was. And Anthony Richardson, on a weekly basis, there's these moments where he's like this is the best athlete on the field. Like he's marvelous and on the ground, he's so dangerous. And yet there aren't other quarterbacks in the league going 11 for 25. Yeah. So this was a game where the, the box score, at least the completion percentage doesn't match um, the level of play because even at one point it was something, it was way worse. It was like five for 14 or five for 15. But he's produced these things like this before. But I I guess, you know, it didn't feel like to me, like he was playing poorly. It was just, everything was really out of sync for the Colts for the better part of two and a half quarters. Uh, but when he turned it on, I just, the, the highest compliment I could pay the guy is when they were down eight late in the fourth quarter and they had already kind of made inroads and, and scored twice already. It just felt like there was no way this guy wasn't going to do it, which is, you know, there's there's not many guys that are like that. And like Richardson, with his ability uh, to do it all, is really, I know with all due respect, respect to C.J. Shroud, who's off to an amazing start himself, like when this season is over, if Richardson stays healthy, he's going to win Offensive Rookie of the Year because mm-hmm. this is going to be an every week thing where he is making plays and he's going to electrify the building. That's a hot take. Texas fans won't like that. Now, and I said, I respect to Stroud, but I think Richardson is box office on a level that that's why Ursay wanted him. And like, just like we were putting down uh, the Rams as a team not to take seriously in the summer, the Colts kind of from afar looked a bit of a, like a clown show, the way it was run last year and all the drama around Jonathan Taylor and man, I know they lost this game, right? but I think both of these teams, they might not be in the Super Bowl, but I think they're going to be hanging around. They remain, both to me, very frisky. Now, with a caveat, as let's let's hear from Matt Stafford, I hope this guy's hip's okay uh, because we do not want to see a limping Matthew Stafford. Let's listen to what he had to say about his injury and how it affected him. It it sounded a little worrisome. The hardest part was just the – it was kind of just shutting down the leg a little bit, right, where you feel like you can – step and you push and normal leg and then step and push and not normal just the muscles were kind of shutting down but um just kept going um knew it was just going to be one of those things that was you know pain slash function as long as i could keep it warm on the sideline and and keep the function going i was you know going to try to stay in there so bird's eye view not the first thing i'd want to hear from my quarterback he does say he'll be out there next week 
That's good. In what in what uh, capacity he, we shall see. Yeah. And it does look like Anthony Richardson got out of this game mm. in one piece, which is also a first in his NFL career. All right, let's now move to Yes, with all due respect, C.J. Stroud is off to a tremendous. I mean, Stroud is the rookie of the year right now. Just saying, and that is not. I'm projecting. Yeah, not, no, that's fair. Yeah. I think that would be. I would go sandwiches with you if Stroud continued to do what he. That's what fair. He's done. And for Richardson, like completion percentage, that's nice. But yards per attempt matters a lot more, and he had about yeah eight yards per attempt and six or seven big time plays in there. So you'll take that trade. He's fun. He's exciting. He's special. Interesting. Okay, now <laughs> C.J. Stroud. Also, you could explain him in that manner and here's what happened in houston today third and seven from the texans 48 stroud shotgun motor in the backfield with him cj gets the snap cj throwing downfield and caught by nico 25 20 breaks a tackle 15 10 5 rock and roll touchdown houston (laughs) cj stroud with more third down magic to the end zone Mm -mm -mm. mark vandermeer with the call Texans radio. I always, I always forget that he does the rock and roll thing. There's, some, there's something like a wholesome uncle vibe about that from Vandermeer. Yeah, they haven't rock and rolled in a while, and that so it's you know he's bringing it back. Rookie C.J. Stroud had another big time showing uh, on Sunday. He threw for over 300 yards, two touchdowns, and the and the Texans. Welcome to the boat race regalia, where you get the bomb <laughs> drops in the woodshed, 30 to <laughs> six over the Steelers. Now we welcome in a man that. He drops bombs on every local gym he steps into, just with what he's putting up. And he does, and he doesn't just work on the beach muscles because he's a Midwest grinder. Um, Nick, how are you? I'm fantastic, guys. I, 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 I don't know if I dropping bombs sounds destructive. <laughs> yeah, you are destructive in the gym. It must disgust you, Nick. Before, I don't want to get off topic here, but when you see those guys, a little twig legs. And the big biceps, and they got they got yeah. the beach muscles, but they're not strong men. Like you, you've, you're repulsed by that, aren't you? They're not doing compound movements. They're skipping leg day. It's all about the glamour muscles. Yeah, yeah, disgusted, absolutely yeah. revolted. Tip how do you over. feel about the three of us when you take a look at how uh, we're appearing here in the middle of or in the early October? Uh, no comment. You all look great. <laughs> okay. Well, he likes being on the show. Yeah. Shooky, uh, Stroud again. Uh, what are you seeing? I mean, he looks fantastic. He looks oh, so going into this draft with this draft class, I I was kind of confused by the consensus that surrounded Bryce Young, because everyone thought he's the far and away number one answer here. He's got everything, blah blah blah. And it was great, but what I saw in C.J. Stroud is somebody who gave you the best chance to win if you played him right away, which you're going to do with most of those guys that you draft there because of his accuracy. His accuracy's been fantastic the last two games. That touchdown pass and that highlight that you just rolled. I mean, he threw that in the perfect spot, not only for Nico Collins to make the catch, but to catch and run down the sideline mm-hmm. for a touchdown. He's done that a number of times his last couple of games. Even in his first game, he did that a few times. He's very settled in and a huge tip of the cap to offensive coordinator, Bobby Slowick, who is doing everything right with CJ Stroud. He's taking advantage of all of his strengths. He's scheming the offense around them. They got a lot of young talent over there. That's all kind of making some plays there. And he looks very comfortable. I think that's the most important part. He is not sped up by the game. He's playing really good football right now. I think Slowick is one of the more interesting stories because he's got a PFF background and he was under Shanahan for a bit in San Francisco. Hasn't like called plays like this before, which you, you hear the narrative about. It takes a couple of years to even figure out situationally what you're doing, but he's done so much with these young players. And I think like his fingerprints are all over Stroud. Yeah, it's uh, it, you're right. The the background is is the whole Shanahan tree, and that's what we're seeing first and foremost. Is a coach who knows how to adapt to the strengths of his player, and to where they're just sliding right in and being very calm. I'm, I'm surprised even myself, and I thought very highly of Stroud coming out of Ohio State that he was going to be the guy that could go win you games the quickest in the NFL. Maybe not the highest ceiling. I think the highest ceiling belongs to Anthony Richardson, but he was going to be a guy that could step in and win games. Even I'm surprised by his performance in the first month of the season where. 50%, if not more, of his games have been so encouraging that when Greg says, you know, he's the rookie of the year right now offensively, I you have to agree. Oh, it's he's not even close. He might, well. he might be a pro bowler. It's four It's four yeah. games in, but just at, at this point, uh, I mean, they're boat racing the Jags, they're boat racing the Steelers, and the thing he's been best at, I think, is dealing with pressure. He hasn't been sacked in the yeah. last two, two weeks, and Laramie Tunsil's out again today. Most of their offensive line is out. They're playing the Steelers, and he's not making negative plays. It's so impressive. What, what was up with the, the Steelers' defense here today and what was up with 
Mike Tomlin punting on fourth and two, down 23 to six in the fourth quarter. I mean, that is something that I know drives Steelers fans crazy, but Mike Tomlin is like an all time, like, I'm just going to give up on the game and punt yeah. to a guy. It drives me crazy. That, that, that's, a, that's a message to his guys. We came out flat. We got knocked in the mouth. We don't deserve to still compete in this game. You guys didn't give enough effort. We played like crap, and now we're going to pay for it. Let's get back on the bus, go to the plane, go back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> that's like one of those, up. and I do it now with my own children, and it happened to me when I was a kid. Sometimes the parental punishment doesn't make any sense, and it's like, this mm-hmm. isn't really thought out, but the parent doesn't want to, <laughs> they, they didn't want to give any ground on, it, on, on any level. Let's listen, Shooky, to Tomlin, um, who... Obviously, you know, they come off a two-game winning streak here, but this this is now another grisly performance by the offense, especially. And he was hinting at, could there be changes? Mike says yes. Changes regarding, hell yeah, we got to make some changes, man. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was an ugly product we put out there today. And so uh, we're not going to do the same things and, and hope for a different outcome. What those changes are, man, we'll put together a plan uh, in preparation. The biggest change, Shook, would be uh, the quarterback position. You have a Kenny Pickett who has not played well this year, but he goes out with a knee injury that we don't know the severity right now. Mitch Trubisky could be on the field for them. Uh, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of mounting criticism around Matt Canada as well, their play caller. How do you see that breakdown in terms of the struggles? Yeah, I think that Pickett has not taken the step forward that you expect from him. The offensive line hasn't done him a lot of favors. Matt Canada has not done him a lot of favors with his play calling. The knee injury, to me, looked kind of bad. Uh, It's not encouraging, Mm. so you might not see him for a little bit. But more importantly than anything, it doesn't matter who you put back there in quarterback. Unless you've got God himself playing quarterback, it's going to be really hard to overcome some of the situations that Matt Canada puts them in. You know, last year and the year before, it was their offensive line is not good enough for them to establish the ground game. Well, now the play calling itself is just so disjointed that every time I look at a play with Kenny Pickett dropping back to pass, it feels like it's third and 13, and he's got no shot because they don't hold up well enough for him to sit back there. He doesn't look comfortable. He's pretty skittish. And when he does throw passes, they're usually contested passes that he expects George Pickens to make superhero plays on. So I'm not confident in this offense at all. And it's really annoying because they have talent. It's just not working right now. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the offense. I do think God would probably pull off like a higher passer rating than what we saw from Pickett today. But your two leading receivers are running backs and neither one of them have more than 32 yards. It's like, I, I guess I, I can't find a team I'm more disappointed in after what I thought we'd be seeing in the growth and development. I thought we'd be seeing in Pittsburgh. It's like, I, I don't know why Canada was retained. Uh, I think that was a surprise to begin with, but it's like, th- I, how much longer do you keep Matt Canada? Well, it depends on how you feel the potential of this team really is for this year. Because I think if you, you can't replace an offensive coordinator in the middle of the season and see an instant turnaround. So I think you're kind of stuck to a degree with what you That's have. how Canada got the job, though. He he did take yeah. over in the middle of the season, and I think he had a decent little run, if I remember, and then, then they ended up keeping the job. Uh, if God was the quarterback, though, you know, he would keep Deontay Johnson healthy. Pratt Firemuth left in this game early with an injury. So things are things are kind of snowballing that you're why does God keep coming out? I, I don't like, know. He uh, said he said God would not be able to God, convert yeah. third Only 13. God would thrive. Save it for the theology offense. podcast, yeah. Yeah. everybody. Jeez Louise. God jogs over and just heals Deontay Yo. <laughs> hamstring right in the field. The Texans are a real thing now. They're in the mix. They're in the playoff mix. Yeah, the AFC are. South is kind of fun, actually. It's a little bit frisky. Shooky, let's head uh to Philadelphia, where we had a game that went right down to the end. It is a 54-yard attempt. These kickers today. My goodness. Hold your breath. Well, this kicker. This guy. Yeah, but he's not alone. He's top five. Very good. And the Eagles win. The Eagles win. Lights out. Jake Elliott does it with his fourth field goal of the day. Mm-mm-mm, Jake Elliott. Yeah, you you get past the velvet ropes. Come on in, buddy. Kicks four field goals, including the 54-yarder. Piped it <laughs> to lift the Eagles to a 34-31 win over the Commanders. They are 4-0 for the second straight year. Elliott also kicked uh, 41-47 and 36 before the last one. The Eagles fans go nuts and... Jalen Hurts, Shooky, and the passing game. Uh, this is progress on Sunday, right? In a game that was closer than maybe some people thought it would be. Yeah, a tip of the cap with the piped it reference to Jay Feely, which is also a double reference at this point in the show. So we got multiple <laughs> layers going on. But Jalen Hurts, man, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, first time that we really saw this passing offense completely open up uh, this season. It's been a bit of a struggle. They've had to rely on the ground game, but they did not have to you know, lean too much on DeAndre Swift in this game. But 
it was it was a really fun battle. Uh, I think on both sides, you know, it told me a lot about Washington. But I was excited to see the Eagles blow it and then bounce back and find a way to win it with a long field goal. Uh, it, they still have some minor issues, but they're a fun watch, especially when Hurts is thrown around like this. Give me some uh, Sam Howell recap here, because to yeah. see to yeah. see Howell survive in a offensive shootout. You expect more out of the commander's defense. So, you know, credit to the Eagles offense for putting it on them today. Uh, but you don't expect the commander's offense to kind of be going toe for toe and give them that lead early in this game. Yeah. They had a 10 point lead early on. I'm thinking, man, are they going to run away with this? Is this going to be one of those games where Sam house says, forget about last week, forget my four ugly interceptions against Buffalo. They don't matter because I'm winning the game of the division this week and I'm doing it my way. Uh, they did blow that lead, but what they did even better was come back. I mean, down to the final play of regulation, there's one second adjusted in two seconds left on the clock. He sits back there. Cool as a cucumber delivers a strike to the right side game tying touchdown on a drive that for a little bit, you know, when they got in the Eagles territory inside, like the 40 looked like they were just going to flat out run out of time. I mean, mm. even the broadcast was like, they're taking too long. They got to go. They got two plays out of the final 10 seconds, maybe three plays. Yeah. Three. And we're able to score on the last one. Kid comes up in the clutch. You know, he's going to have some issues, some warts early on in his career, but he's a gamer. He's a gamer with some ability, and he's really, really fun to watch, even though they lost this game. I think he's had been sacked 24 times. And, I mean, I know a lot of that is on him. It's uh, the line. It's the whole thing. That that has to be corrected at some point. I, I, I was so glad to see the Eagles pull this out, though, because, like, A.J. Brown – Nine catches for 175 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, it's like, you're right. This just shows you the power and the versatility of this offense. But he had that that at the, the penalty, the, the taunting penalty after that score. And it's like, I don't think if that happens, and you can argue whether that was deserved or not, if that penalty does not happen, like Washington probably runs out of time and doesn't get close enough to do what they mm. needed to do at the end there. And it's like he would have played quietly this goat role when he's like an ap absolutely epic hero in this contest. Yeah, but you know what? I'd give him a pass for that because the taunting was so brief. I saw it happen live and I thought, oh, be that's careful. That's what I don't think it was. A, I thought it was, a, a, it was a shaky call. Go for two, though. He turned and, like, looked at him a little bit closely as he was running yes. away from him. Was... I don't like that. Go for two. Go for two, Ron. You know what? All of Lincoln Financial Field was sweating yes. bullets about and hoping that yeah. you didn't do, Ron Rivera? Yes. Go for two. Yes. Where's the yes. riverboat? Where is it? Is it retired? Is it currently in the shipyard forever? You gotta get forever? back on. Well, maybe because of the boat race for Gallia, it was booked up, the the, the oh, yeah. waterway. And Slow they, moving get boat, it out there. too. Couldn't get out there. All right, no Shooky, we're gonna let you off the hook here. You can get on the boat so you don't have to talk about the Browns. Um, Ooh, yikes. But, um, <laughs> thank you, sir, uh, as always, and we'll uh, see you next Sunday. See you, Shook. That was so merciful, guys. I appreciate you. See ya. <laughs> All right. Later, buddy. All right. Let's take a break, and then we will move on. All right. Welcome back. It is time now for the Sunday Drive presented by the first ever Toyota Grand Highlander. Let's head to Big D, where Cowboys are big mad after an ugly week three showing. Second and 10. Jones is back. Plenty of time. Rolls right. Bottled up. Throws back to the head. Intercepted. No. Deron Bland. Hello House. Hello House. House, it's me, Duran. Hello House. <laughs> That's our guy. For Duran Bland. Wow. That's our dude. Freestyling a little. Sham God. Brad Sham, the Sham God, with the call. Duran Bland returned one of his two picks to the house untouched. Leighton Vanderesh also scooped up a fumble on a Mac Jones uh, sack. Ran it back for a score, and the Cowboys hammer the Patriots 38-3. to three. Um, Interesting, boys. Uh, Greg? Mac Jones doesn't finish this game, uh, and there's going to be a um, groundswell of people saying he's the reason why they got destroyed in this game. He's uh, one of them. Is that... Uh, is that fair? Do you do you think the cow the Patriots are heading towards something here uh, with their one time first round pick? Well, if we're if we're talking about that, we do have Belichick on Mac Jones after oh, we the game, right? Let, Wait, let, we have a show where we could hear from Mike McDaniel and Bill Belichick. Yeah, let, let's just show. hear him uh, about Mac Jones. Yeah, about the game on Sunday. So what led to the decision um, to take Mac out with three forty one remaining in the third quarter? Yeah, I think there was any point in leaving him in the game. Next week against the Saints. Yeah, I just said there's no point in leaving him in the game, Mike. <laughs> in that like sense, I mean, 
Yeah. Do you think consider taking like no. Judon out on the other Ooh. side or you know, Ooh, like, zinger. Yeah. Got him in the ribs. No effect. Yeah, I mean, you got to put somebody out there. <laughs> some, some effect. It took wow. about 10 seconds to answer. So, Bill, was he, was he benched for that pause? No. Or was he pulled? <laughs> no, I said there was no point in leaving him out there, so I took him out. That pause, by the way, that you heard, that pregnant pause was Bill in his mind trying to figure out if he could make Mike Reese disappear under the mess pike and not be connected to it. I mean, he's that's happened to other people connected with well, the Patriots before. So. Mike, Mike might be... The leader in the clubhouse is the best beat writer out there in the game right now in terms of longevity and quality. Hey, you and don't Bill, get under to the mess pike unless Bill yeah. Belichick respects you. But he's been there 20 years, so he can <laughs> ask those tough questions. And it, he does plan to start him next week. Uh, he did make it clear in that press conference. He did say yes uh, once pressed on it, you know, if, if Mac is going to start. But this was the worst possible game in all ways for the Patriots. Mac Jones mentally crumbled after a couple pretty good drives. I thought to start the game where they, they get a field goal and then they turn it over on downs. It, it, he is so unathletic and you try to look past that. Cause he has other things that, you know, in theory can make up for that, but let's look at how they turned it over on downs. They, they do the, t the tush push, right. Mm. And it was blocked up pretty well, but Mac Jones just sort of just like falls forward. There was no defenders there. Like, he could have run forward. They don't get it. And then the whole rest of the game, it turns into this Mac Jones, like, I'm going to try to play hero ball and panicking and really reminding me of a year ago where he's throwing the ball across his body. Deron Bland almost had two pick six. Deron Bland's a great player, by the way, or a great young player, promising five picks as a rookie last year. Didn't get a lot of pop, replacing Trayvon Diggs. So that's great for the Cowboys. We'll get to the good part of the Cowboys. It's just so many bad decisions. And then... By the end, middle of the third quarter, why you had to take him out, even on plays that were perfectly blocked, Mac was completely freaking out and kind of th not throwing it to open receivers and then doing crazy things. And so he's mentally collapsing. You have no explosive element to your offense. And then, as you heard from Mike Reese, Matt Judon, their best defensive player, gets hurt in the fourth quarter of a total blowout. The way the teammates were talking after the game, oh, no. it sounded like it could be – uh, a long-term injury. They're reporting it as a biceps injury, so that's probably a torn biceps. And Christian Gonzalez, their defensive rookie uh, of the month for September in the NFL, left very early with what appeared to be a serious shoulder injury. So everything that could go wrong did. It, it was a humbling day for the Patriots. The worst loss of Belichick's head coaching career. 24 seasons, The and Pat fans will remember the other one. It was the season opener against Buffalo in 2003-31 zip. Even worse than any Browns loss he had. Right. Throw yeah, but those, those, five those Browns seasons. teams did not get blown out. And the though. difference is, like, like that 2003 team. For a while. What did that 2003 team do, Greg? They won the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl. But everything feels different. Obviously, everything is different. Tom Brady's not there anymore. But in general, the, the ship feels like it's, it's swaying a little bit. And I thought – and I – I, you know, this is not me being a bitter Jets fan, but I've seen the face, um, that face that a quarterback makes when he's had a terrible day and he's still going back out on the field. I think Belichick made the right move to get him out of that game because they showed him on the sideline and you could tell he, he was, he had no answers. He capitulated on some level. And I thought he played really well the first three weeks, but he, today was a See, lot on him. And we're going to disagree on that because I, I don't, see the same level of play in Mac Jones, um, even though he has made throws this season at times. I just don't I don't think he's special or even and or even maybe no. average. And I'm wondering as we and we could talk about this down the line, but that Mac Jones uh, uh, mark becomes like if 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 this season goes where it might be going for New England, that Mac Jones is a sacrificial lamb after this. It's not Belichick, and they get to start over, and he gets to start over with a QB and gets one last chance with this team. I don't think that would be totally unfair, other than the fact that like Bill Belichick scouted and picked this player, so it's not entirely on Mac Jones. Last year it was, you know, complete freebie because you you had a, you know chaos in the coaching situation on offense. You've got Bill O'Brien, uh, and. Greg, I I just don't see the player that you see when it comes to Mac Jones. I'm not saying that you think he's some great guy, but no, like, I just think he can be average. But and their offensive line has can, been you, so bad. If you're going to be year. average. You're yeah. going to float in another world in the AFC or in the NFC. It's right. Like, and this is a team right now that when I watch them on offense, it's like your selling point was Ramondre Stevenson, flatlining. Like the, this is an this is an offense 
from like 1991. There's and there's defensive strengths, but like you're not you're this is not a modern day 2023 offense. No, they're they allowed the Cowboys and and we can get to the Cowboys now like to sit on these short routes. And Bland was asked about it by our old colleague Mike Giardi after the game about City on these routes, and he's just like, "Hey, look, that's what we saw in film." And so what he's saying is. They can't push the ball down the field. Mac Jones doesn't have the arm or athleticism to make extra plays down the field. And then more importantly to me, and this is completely on Belichick, the whole team is on Belichick. And I don't think Belichick will survive this season unless they win eight or nine games. I think he'll be fired. I also think it's a long way from saying they won't win eight or nine games. It's early. It's one and three. But I, I, think, on Monday? <laughs> I think Kraft will get rid of him if, if it goes south. He put this entire team together. They have no explosive players, right? No. Those are all his players. The Juju signing, it's going to continue to build up as a, another thing to point to. He just doesn't have athleticism himself, it seems, when he's trying to come out of these routes. It's it's ugly. And the, and the Cowboys, like I, I said on Thursday, uh, BTT, if this is a big-time team, you take that ugly Cardinals loss and you take it out on a middling team in your building. It's exactly what they did, which is why I was so surprised uh, that – Still waiting for those rain clouds. You, there are L's that the Rainmaker has taken over years, and then there are capital L's. Yeah. This is uh, this is a big one. This is a big one. You know, somebody's daughter isn't getting braces. <laughs> no, too bad for her. Somebody's son isn't going to prom. Hey. Yeah. You got to play the long game, but you got to take the L's when they come. How much does prom cost? Oh, the toilet doesn't work? Now you got to go outside. Because Greg picked with his heart, not his head. Then we four. Thought I was with the head. You know, you just got to accept this, and you got to move on when you take an, an L this this poor. G give credit. It, it give puts credit a lot of deck. pressure on the Rainmaker now, Mark, for the next one. Ooh. Because he's got to, as a showman, he's got to come out and say, I know I let you down. Mm. This one is my guarantee. Yeah, yep, double you double this up or you completely forget about it for like five more weeks until in the middle of the show you're like oh i haven't done a rainmaker is it you still have that drop eric like one second before doing it. bad job by me i do want to just give some props to dak who was who i mentioned going into this game this might be a tough matchup for him oh my god he no played, ghosts he played so well you know they're nine and one in their last 10 games after a loss averaging 33 points this is a team that bounce ba bounces back his decision making, his passes were on point. I think he was seven for nine on throws that were at least 10 yards down the field. A lot of these were right in the bucket. And I know the Patriots are down three or four of their top cornerbacks, but they were great throws. Gallup's been playing much better these last couple weeks. A lot of Jake Ferguson is a real tight end. They have a lot of positives. So they had that one bad game, but a lot of positives for Dak. Uh, the Cowboys next Sunday night, 49ers week. New Woo game of the year. New game of the year. Woo wee. Well, so you have to go. You have to go go toe to toe with the Niners, and like you can't have another flat performance. Well, I've I believe to them talk about it. I know Make you. Believe, I know you believe in them, and like I, I, I have fair historical reason to be suspicious that they'll win twelve games and then go flat again. Oh, well, that's the past. This is now. It's a, literally a week ago. <laughs> they they're not going to go. They're not going to go seventeen and zero. Every team is mean, going to have some. You just. Bump. I. We'll see. We'll see. So now you're out on the Cowboys. I thought you were in this year. No. Oh. Okay. I'm in on the Niners, but it's like I like I, I what happened last week kind of reconfirmed just suspicions about Dallas. It's, it's an NFL. Unfair. It's an NFL game. And Th today things happen. Did that? I I love what they did today. It's like I things love, happen. I, I trust them to do it about twelve times. Then January will come. I'll just say this: we're nobody's underdog. Damn right, Zaddy. And I see you, Bones Fossil. Little trick two point conversion. Dan Quinn doing his thing. What a staff. What a team. They were up twenty eight three at half. Time and uh, Dan Quinn was like, "Not today, not this time." Team of ATN, the Mark. Cowboys. Mark, <laughs> you're gonna it. probably get Super Bowl two weeks of Super Bowl nonsense with them if you, if it goes your way. So that'll be enough for me. That would be great. <laughs> All right, uh, you know who might not be playing in the Super Bowl this year? The Bengals. Things are going bad. Let's head to Oops. Nashville. Tannehill under center. You the handle that well, Greg. Now, that was a very humbling. Right. What can what can you do when you're Simmons. that wrong? It's hard to be He's more wrong about anything than I was. Rolling, Brace. throwing, Tannehill, Go! touchdown, Titans! Brace, that's the word. Henry, I should say, is the man who rolls and throws. 
all that movement just freaked me out. <laughs> and Cincinnati was more lost than me. <laughs> okay. Whoa, my keep. Again, more grace. Owned it, turned it into beauty. That's magic. Titans radio. The Titans, listen, There's a there are teams that are difficult to figure out in this league, many of them actually. The Titans have been all over the map so far. And this week, this Sunday, it was the best version of the Titans. Ryan Tannehill throws for 240 and a touchdown. Derrick Henry looks like Derrick Henry again, even with that jump pass TD throw, which I love. And they trounced the Bengals 27-3 to in Nashville. Um, quite a uh, performance for Tennessee all the way around. They only had 94 yards of offense last week against Cleveland. And they scored 27 straight points in this game, Mark. And, I, like, I, I think it's it's uh, a credit to Tennessee, but that's not what people, and I know our buddy um, Gravedigger and Titans fans are going to say everybody should be focusing on what the Titans can do uh, when they are, you know, in their bag. But everyone is obviously going to focus on Cincinnati being completely lost at sea um, on both sides of the ball in this game, but especially on offense, where once again you had a limited burrow unable to do anything uh, in this offense going nowhere fast. Two things are happening because Gravedigger and Titans fans are correct because as hot and cold as they are, when they're hot and they appear under the Mike Rabel leadership the way that they have in the past, I watched a team that was like more physical than Cincinnati that beat them up all over the place, mm -hmm. that nullified their pass rush when they have a weak offensive line. Oh, yeah. Did they, when Henry threw that lob, did that not come after a timeout where, like, they saw Henry lined up in a direct snap situation on the play before? Oh, it was awesome. They go back and they kind of collect themselves, and then Henry just throws the no, he, he scores was, on the next play. It was very Vrabel, and, and I'll give him credit, and I'll give Tim Kelly credit, their OC, who they had, they cooked up some good stuff in this game where they head to the goal line, and it's Jeffrey Simmons, a tickle monster, uh, serving as the up back with Derrick Henry back, and and Cincinnati's like, holy sh. <laughs> And they and they call timeout, and then you know what Rabel does? It sends the same uh, setup on the field. They run the same play, and they're like, "We don't care about you being able to recalibrate yourselves. You're still not going to stop this." And they did not. And that it's like Lou Anarumo has been a bright spot when they've when they've tried to get through these games. And I, I think he's a great coordinator. But coaching in general with the Bengals to have this last year's ugly start, this year's start, it certainly ties to the body of Joe Burrow. I, he's struggling. He took us some terrible hits in this game today. And at one point, I saw him kind of coming off to the sideline and testing his arm elbow. He got, he just, it's, you, you're not going to get out of this if your quarterback's not healthy. And it's not the only problem on this team right now. Right. That's the thing that gets me and why I wasn't over the moon about the Monday night victory. That was a nice night. It was like a, a championship effort to get through that. Scuddy. But in this game, they got almost doubled up in total yardage, 400 to 211. They didn't have a single play over 17 yards on offense. That's been consistent. Their offense has been bad all four games, including against the Rams, one of the most defensive challenge teams in the league, and they struggled in that game. And it's mostly about Burrow, but the offensive line has not looked good, and they didn't look good when Burrow was moving a little better the first couple of weeks. So there's a lot going on with this team. Yeah, and I mean, I... I said it on Thursday still feel this way and it and you can now say they, well they're not they don't have this uh, ability to do this you got to sit down the quarterback he can't this I know you're one in three and you're probably under the belief if we sit the quarterback down our season's over but you can't keep sending him out like this in addition to it being just sad to watch it's ineffective. Can and he it's, move okay he, no he can't he's not moving at all mm. everything again is out of the shotgun there is so everything is out of his hands immediately. And Tennessee, just like we thought, was going to be a problem. It was a problem because the offensive line was getting beat. And once that uh, pass rush was on top of him, he's taken some nasty shots. So you could survive on Monday night with that game plan against a lesser team uh, or a lesser defense. But in this game, that's a taste of what's going to continue to happen until he gets hurt. And he's either going to pop the calf again or. Or it's going to be a different injury like we saw almost happen in this game. And who knows how he's going to feel when he wakes up. So I think it's high past time that you need to sit this guy down. Your season's already on the ropes. you got to stop pretending if you're Zach, Zach Taylor. And I think Zach Taylor deserves 
blame for this as well because you're not seeing, and a lot of Bengals fans are pointing to Taylor as the number one problem. Oh, I got some spice rack text to read off. I still think that's un- understandable, but it's crazy to me that people don't just say, well, Joe Burrow is 40% or 30%. How do you not say that's the problem? You could say it's the play caller, and maybe there's a, there is some route here where they, they call a different type of game that makes them more effective. I just don't see it with Burrow at quarterback. I don't think there is a path to competency on offense with the way this guy is. Mm. They can't dominate people on the ground the way that they were a couple of seasons ago alongside his play. T. Higgins gets lost to cracked ribs, I think it is. I mean, it's like the house is starting to burn around you, and it's like the whole AFC North is a bit of a shambles save for one team right now. Right. Meanwhile, the AFC South, and we'll we'll get to, I guess, the last team here, but I think do we have a four-way tie at two and two? Mm. They're all a little frisky with some 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 frisky wins, but uh, yeah, spice rack. Uh, you know Wes, what? It's spicy. Wes is great, great friend. Um, who who is a Bengals fan and has always never believed in Zach Taylor, kind of like me. Uh, just points out opening drive, eleven plays down to the one. One. What do they do? They kick an eighteen yard field goal. Two minutes ago in the first half, down seventeen, fourth and three. What do they do? They punt the ball into the end zone for a touchback. Cowardly dip blank. That's, that's, that's what he wrote. What he says. <laughs> and he, he says if he had a charming personality that like the players liked, uh, he'd under like he could get behind that. But he's also <laughs> kind of a zero there. He said right. he was like, give me Steve that Mariucci at least that people just like, you know, at least like a like. Yeah, figure. I'm sure Bengals fans would be cool with Mooch on this. Well, I, I think he meant back. I think <laughs> I love Mooch. He's but, saying you know. back in the day. He's right. saying like, OK, maybe you don't have. Like, you're not the X's and O's guy, but at least be the guy everyone can That's get behind. I, if, I, if you were to say, like, give me three, you know, foundational anchors of the Zach personality, I couldn't right. come up with that. I mean, you went to the Super Bowl. That's all I know about you. That's and good. and nice, on the nice other team, side, you got a guy in Vrabel who you lose one week 27-3, and the next week you come back, win 27-3. That's kind of a Vrabel type of team. They had lost nine perfect. of their last ten, and you still believed in them. Mm. When you have success like the Bengals have had the last two years, and Cincinnati fans have gotten a taste of that, this has been a very hard crash back to earth. Um, Expectations are hard. That's why I think staying at the top is so hard. The Rainmaker knows a little bit about that. What do you mean? Well, after what happened this I week. mean, 0-1. Oh you, you know, it's one game. Um, not, but, to, not to the people that, you know, had a Hey, if they're following my picks strike. on game day view, they're riding to the top in first very place good. there. Um, I don't know if you get Kyle Shanahan on this sideline. Greg right tends now. to think a lot of people out there are very focused on his. You guys just said people are losing their house. So well, I'm that's saying, true. I'm they, saying if not you're going to get there, you know, anyone that knows, you got to spread it out. They you probably will be out. ghosting on your Rainmaker predictions. Yeah, I'm not, I didn't say anything about a house. I mentioned little Bucktooth Susie Q. <laughs> who, you know, she'll say that way. She'll die alone. Get some Invisalign at least, you know. <laughs> Uh, yes, and you mentioned T. Higgins suffered some type of rib injury, and potentially, uh, I saw I think it's Florio fracture, yeah. say that he is facing perhaps an a- absence of weeks. Yikes! Okay, uh, speaking of yikes, uh, the Cleveland Browns had a play without Deshaun Watson, and they learned that that is difficult business. Lamar in the shotgun, three receivers bunched to the right. Jackson takes the snap, steps up. Throws it complete. Andrews has it at the 10. Five touchdown Ravens. And with 5.56 left to play in Cleveland, the Hayes in the barn. Ooh. Six minutes to play. Sandusky drops the Hayes in the barn for the Ravens, who go to Cleveland and spank the Browns 28-3, who, as I said, played without Deshaun Watson, who was scratched. He warmed up on the field before the game, but a shoulder injury kept him out of the game. They put the rookie in, and the rookie uh, and the offense, the rookie being Dorian Thompson-Robinson, unable to move the ball. Mark Sessler, uh, this is a a humbler for uh, the the Browns, I imagine, who, you know, we came off a week of talking about their defense and against a hated rival, a bit of a no-show, it looks like, in your own building. This game was over a lot earlier than with six minutes to go. Um, it It's the kind of loss where I can understand that you've got Dorian Thompson Robinson in there, fifth round pick who looked absolutely and utterly lost against a veteran Ravens defense. Cool. I get it. I didn't expect them to necessarily even have such a chance to compete if he didn't look good. I hoped he would. Um, it was the opposite. You don't have Nick Chubb. Like after halftime, they had 10 yards rushing and they can't, they just couldn't get anything going on that side of the, of the ball of the ball. And, the Baltimore Ravens, my one thought was like, 
not unlike a Jets situation. If you had a quarterback in there that needed a lot of support and was going to struggle, you've got this defense that we've been talking about for three-plus weeks. And the Ravens started a little bit slowly, and I thought, this is Cleveland's doorway into a potential upset, and you get Watson back, and you keep going. You have a bye week next week. They got walked over. I mean, it was kind of bizarre to watch because you did lose Darius Smith for a bit. Um, Miles Garrett got banged up late. But in general, this was the defense from these other weeks, led by Jim Schwartz. And it was Mark Andrews rumbling for 36 yards on a catch, which at one point was their biggest play kind of early on. But then Justice Hill gets going with a 15-yard run, a 7-yard run. Melvin Gordon gashes them for a 22-yard run. They're suddenly up with a Lamar Jackson touchdown, 14-3. to And you sense the game was over because they were getting hotter and hotter and mm-hmm. walking through Cleveland's defense in a way that it looked like the last 20 years – And so I'm a little mystified because this is a Ravens team missing all sorts of star players and supporting cast, and they put it to Cleveland, and it isn't simply on the quarterback. The defense did not show up. Baltimore was without two wide receivers. Their starting left tackle, uh, their starting right tackle went out, and Greggy, the Lamarmi, this is another good one for the Lamarmi now because he steps in with the team uh, on the road against a punishing defense, uh, undermanned. He scores four touchdowns, two on the ground, two through the air, and that's what a superstar uh, quarterback does. Just so efficient. 19 throws for 186 yards. So, you know, only four incompletions. You're playing this defense that, that we've heard a lot about, but I'm always wary of teams that are mostly about the defense in the year 2023. Because I read this, this article once, it's always stuck with me, that by far the most predictive thing in terms of who has a good defense is just the schedule you played. Like the, the correlation is so strong of just like, and it's not everything. The Browns stomped bad offensive lines more than other teams were stomping bad offensive lines, but still by far the best correlation to the defensive rankings are who has played the worst offenses, who's played the easiest schedule. And now they played a, a professional offense, one missing a lot of players, like five starters, on offense alone, and four or five on defense. It was crazy how many cornerbacks, two of their their starting pass rushers, the Ravens, were missing. And you have to give them a lot of credit because I think that's what 2023 is about too is, like, who can win when you're missing so many players? Because it just seems like injuries are destroying half the teams in the league. And the Browns, for instance... Uh, at least in terms of their running game, just haven't been able to like survive that injury. Well, they weren't like they weren't built to be just around defense either. That they're right. in that situation now because you lost maybe right. the best this, running back in, in this the league. game is, I guess, what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, but they were sitting ducks in this. I mean, you talk about like teams you're playing and offenses you're playing. Like the Ravens walked into a great situation today, so it's like we could go and overinflate who they are because they've been as inconsistent versus expectations on offense as anyone. With three first half touchdowns, and I know they got a couple extra possessions, so maybe that is the difference. But three Cleveland first... had nine, like nine drives under 10 yards, it just, and they looked like it, and there were massive turnovers, and, you know, DR, DTR is, like, lost on the field out there, and, like, whipping, like, they were having him throw these crazy deep passes, and then you got, like, who's helping him? You got Elijah Moore, like, doing this one play that I think is the worst play I've seen all season where he takes an end around, and instead of realizing it's a loss, like continues to figure eight backwards and takes a 20-yard loss. And it's like, that's not how you help a fifth-round rookie quarterback that found out minutes before the game he was going to start. Is it weird that, so the Browns, they had a, a last drive, obviously, where it didn't mean anything. They picked up 53 yards. They had 113 yards going into that last drive. It's just me or we're seeing this every week with it multiple like teams. There's just like a lot of offenses that are totally no-showing uh, throughout the league, maybe it's maybe it's just how I feel it rather than no, the reality. Right. I mean, you're feeling it a lot with your offense, right? But but <laughs> I would say in general, every we cover three of these, two or three of these early games and the late ones, like how many halves end where like right. a veteran that you trusted has like 47 yards passing, or like yeah, a t- team X has 98 yards heading into their final possession. It's just like hmm, okay. It's, it's woodshed. Uh... Woodshed Sunday. Woodshed what are we week. Talking about? Woodshed week. So boat race w. regalia. Yeah. Bomb drop Sunday. Four. Part four. Part four. All it's the fourth week. <laughs> all, all of that happened. Oh. They've been happening on a weekly basis. If you look, but. all of that happened. And and you know, yes, the Ravens have quietly had one of the best first quarters in the NFL. Not just because they're three and one. Okay. Uh, but because they get this division win here. What are they in the? Have they won a couple of division games? Haven't they right now? Because they beat the Bengals. So they're they're, in they're first two place. and zero in the division. Yep. The Bengals are a mess. The Browns will see. The Steelers are a mess. 
it's been a nice, you know, that division looked nice going a into the season. Beautiful start. Right. Yes. Right. I mean, other than the the injuries, which obviously to the running back position and the wide receiver. But here's position. the thing: they're getting most of those guys back. Yes. Well, not the we running think. back. No, not J.K. Dobbins. Uh, and we'll see where Miles Garrett is at. Uh, Mark, he had a boot on after this game. He took a yeah. he wrapped up Lamar on a play. And I was surprised they showed the replay more than once because I was like, oh, I think Miles Garrett's out for the year. And like, Ew. and he's walking around, but he has a foot injury, apparently. But I'm with you, Greg. Like, I think that you, the Ravens are still a team in progress, but the other three teams have like glowing red flags right now. Also, uh, also glowing. No, that's terrible. The ginger man? Uh, no. Uh, David Njoku set his face on fire with a fire pit uh, this weekend, um, which is wild because I've done things like that in the past. Um, when you got that, you got that. Oh, shut up, Greg. We're not taking it out of the show. Greg in a panic trying to get our. I was not. I'm just. <laughs> act, I'm just reacting honestly in the moment. I never said we would. Take Here's it the thing. The you turn that propane tank on, and you and you're using the starter. The starter never works. So I'll tell you what Anju could probably do. He went to get the the lighter thing. Yeah, the little handle thing. Yeah. But meanwhile, the propane gas has been rumbling. Sure. For you know, Greg, in upwards of sixty seconds, perhaps. And then when it finally lights, it's it's like um, Oppenheimer. Well, he owned it. I love that he showed up to the stadium. With We've a, all been there. With a mask on over that was his actually face. Cool. And he ends up leading the team with six <laughs> catches and 46 yards. So, you know, I like that. He showed up. Mark. He's, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, it was a gutsy performance, all things considered. I've always liked that in Joku. I don't know why. Um, so get well soon, son. All right, here we go. Son, what? Uh, let us move on to London. Shall we go to London? I Let's think do we it. It's Let's get on the plane and go to London. Falcons on the move here. Algier, the running back, straight drop. That ball's going to be picked off. Darius Williams, 50, 45, 40. Darius along the left oh, side. Oh, no. 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Jacksonville. A pick six for Darius. Mm. God save the king. Remix. Key change. Is this the song? Remix. <laughs> it's queen. I don't think we have the rights. Yeah. Is this the song? I didn't think so, but I. But I. It's British. E. It, yeah. It's, but it, no, it's not that. Eric, song. is this got orchestra? King. This is what I've been using for our London but, stuff. Wait. That, but now we're getting there. Yes. Yeah. We're just a bunch of dumb Americans. We don't know the long version. We don't claim to know. You know what? How about this, England? little radio edit on the National Anthem. And we'll see you in a couple weeks, and we'll talk about it personally. Frank Frangie with the call. <laughs> Darius Williams with the pick six. One of uh, several bad throws from Desmond Ritter, uh, whose struggles continued as the Jaguars cruised to a 23-7 win in their adopted hometown, secondary hometown, of London, England. So that game is at Wembley Stadium. We'll be at the Hot Toddy in a couple weeks, and we can't wait. Uh, Calvin Ridley also had a touchdown in this game in his, I guess, quasi-revenge game against the Falcons. And, uh, um, Greg, um, we'll start with the Jaguars here. Kind of a tough team to figure out this season. I'm not watching this game, and, and my takeaway is, Wow, Jacksonville is they're they're a team to really take seriously in the AFC right now. But they took care of business here against a, a, a offense in Atlanta that just not doesn't have it together right now. No, it was a, it was a survive and advance game that started off really promising for the Jaguars, and and I like that about it. The first three drives, they, they were ahead 146 to 11 yards after the first three drives, and then you started to see the Jags' offense that we've seen the rest of the year, which is really stuck in mud and jet and Lawrence getting rid of the ball too quickly. Cause they don't really trust the offensive line. His average depth of target is at the very bottom of the league, but he's been playing well. I thought they really made an effort to de-emphasize Calvin Ridley and to emphasize Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram, 20 targets for those two mm. early and often only two for Ridley. They got the touchdown on a busted coverage and, and Ridley was wide open for that touchdown. They had almost no big plays other than that. And so I'm still a little concerned about their offense, but in terms of a survive and advance moment, I do think their defense has looked better than I expected this season overall. It's definitely a good run defense. And if you're a good run defense, 
the Falcons don't have anything to do because because no. they can't do anything. And even Bijan got off. I mean, Bijan, what did he go for? 137 yards from scrimmage. And even then, it's like the Falcons couldn't do anything. A lot of that came too late. I mean, I like I closely watched the beginning of this game and started to lose hope with each drive. They have a nine yard three and out the Falcons. They have a one yard three and out. They have a six play drive that goes six yards. The terrible pick six. Ritter comes back from that. Like, who are you, Desmond Next Ritter? Next play. Next play, another pick. And it's like, we don't need to focus on the on the ground game entirely if you're a defense, if this team is going to just completely implode while Jacksonville, because I, I like kind of, I'm not that impressed with Jacksonville's offense this year compared to like what they were towards down the stretch last year. I do think that Lawrence is not the reason for that. Uh, but the Falcons doing this are not going to beat anyone. And like, like, you know, I mean, early on in the season, watching what they could do on the ground, I kind of thought, like, the lack of, like, faith through Ritter in the air, you can get by, you can beat up some teams and do it in an old-school way, and it's like, you can't hide him. You can't well, hide him. Well, he's it's worse like, than I ever imagined We mentioned with so Pit- far. with Pittsburgh's offense, like, r- trying to run a 1991, o- was it Pittsburgh? New England. New England's offense. Like, that's the thing. You can't really do it. You can't just say... Just give it to Bijan and give it to Algier, and, and then defense gets stops. You can't hide a quarterback, and I think Arthur Smith is – I think he knows it, but he's doing that thing that head coaches do where everyone else knows it, and he probably knows it too, but the words he's choosing to use with the media make you feel like he doesn't know it, and even if he does know it, <laughs> it's not like a good look because he's letting people – think that he doesn't know it let's listen to Arthur Smith on uh, his thoughts on the offense and whether he has the right players in place to succeed they're asking about the quarterback everybody's gonna be frustrated after a loss but when you have the right guys and the right mindset they're gonna understand like hey let's not let them get early momentum you know make the play on the sack don't let a busted coverage you know got leak out uncover you know those are things you, you look at in reality I mean I think if you've got the wrong guys, uh, it's easy to, to splinter and ride the roller coaster. But uh, we got the right guys in there. And the mean, other, the he sounds po- defeated to me in that situation. But you have you have Taylor Heineke. Well, that's the thing. And this is the other thing he did that got him. Because I have not been an Arthur Smith fan this year either. I just don't like the way this offense is being run. And at halftime, you know, he comes out and does, you know, talks to CBS or wherever the game was played. Who was a, Were they on ESPN? No, ESPN Plus. Yeah. ESPN Plus. And he he makes a point. We're not even thinking about making a change. And Greg, I saw your tweet and I agreed with it 100%. That was a perfect Taylor Heineke spot yes. to yep. go in there, see if he can get hot and go steal a game because Jacksonville was kind of asking to give it away, it felt like. Right. And to Ritter's credit, he played better for a minute coming out of halftime. They had the touchdown drive right out of halftime and then they drove down the field. But then the inconsistencies popped up and it's like he doesn't want to hurt Ritter's confidence. But... Ritter's play is hurting Ritter's confidence. Ritter throwing up a moon ball to an open Mac Hollins that could have been a third interception. He really could have had two more. And then going over to the sideline and trying to high five Mac Hollins for some I reason. Saw that. And Mac Hollins like stands up in his yeah. face and like, cut camera, cut away. I, was, I wish I had seen the rest of that interaction because it's like the players know he's not playing confident. The one thing he did last year was avoid big mistakes. And this year, it's all big mistakes, but with no playmaking to make up for it. Their defense has been better. Bijan has been as advertised. He was electric in this game, made a lot of uh, great plays throughout, but it's like a running back's only going to do so much. Josh Allen for the Jaguars was massive in this. I mean, I feel like he's a player that sort of comes and goes, but he completely destroyed Atlanta's offense. And I don't know. Like, I don't know what you do. To, what do you say to your fan base? But especially to your own locker room. We're seeing this happen with a couple teams where it's like the quarterback decision-making process to get you to the point where this guy's starting for you creates a total fractured locker mm. room. Falcons fan players seem to be frustrated. And you clearly have a guy. We don't think Taylor Heineke is perfect. But he's a bit of an adventure. And when he gets going, like, there's a lot to like. And it's like this – like, I think – I agree with Arthur Smith on one thing. There are a lot of the right people here. This is a – pretty interesting roster, but right. the most important piece is failing you in well, lifetime. That's, that's why I didn't love the quote because everyone knows there's a lot of good I pieces totally there. Agree and with it's you. like, I, think- you're, I know you're trying to hide from what the big situation here is, but he's got to be careful because if he if he gets, stays, it's like in Vegas, like 
you made a bad bet potentially here. I think it's a bad bet with Ritter. If you stay with this bad bet and you double down, you're going to get cleaned out. And guess what? You're going to lose your job well, he's just because you wouldn't, like- get, you wouldn't realize reality with Ritter. And I know it's still only week four, but there's so much evidence here that this guy is not the guy. Or Yeah, he's just thinking, when is the right time to do this? He didn't think it was halftime. Hearing the way his voice sounded, yeah, he sounded. Me, it actually made me think, like, oh, maybe, maybe it would happen. Like, because who knows? Ritter is capable, I think, of playing better at some point than this. Maybe it's after getting benched for Heineke for a little while. You, you are two and two in a bad division, so I get it. It's still early, but it's it's getting it just it's just everyone can see it. Um, all right, let's. Uh, oh, move. We got to mention at least yes. a shout out to the Toy Story broadcast who made my son uh, Walker as happy <laughs> as I think I've ever seen him watching anything. He could not have really? loved it more. I think kids kids love watching video games in general. Like they just like watching two different people play Madden, and so I think this was kind of like that, except it was like an actual game that was going on. And I know there were some. Some little errors, like the first touchdown, it, they, they dropped it on the Toy Story broadcast or whatever, but they, the, the announcer said that he caught it. And the, but I was sat, sort of blown away in the little that I watched it. And more importantly, like, he was like a kid on Christmas. And I, t- I was texting with a couple other parents that enjoyed it as well. So, like, why not try it? It's fun. I so I watched that really closely. Actually, it's not for adults. Well, no. So my thing is, if 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 I'm hearing the children are enjoying it, like, okay, case closed. Um, there were some technical difficulties, but that it was the trial run essentially with it. There was a moment that I thought was interesting. Uh, they had like this claw that was basically dropping the football down. Yeah. Like in from spotted Toy it. Story, the claw. And, yeah. And they grabbed like a, at one point they grabbed a player and like yanked him away. Um, there was some hinky stuff going on. I think there's a great drinking game attached to this mm. because they mentioned um, Andy's room uh, like four or five times in the first room. They kept like making it clear for people walking by. We're in Andy's room playing this game in his room. The kid from Toy Story. That was uh, the stadium. Yeah. 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 And so like they I think they said Andy's room by the time I left uh to come here in the third mid third quarter about 175 times. Well, yes, I kept seeing uh, uh I saw one tweet that was like, "Why are they explaining how to get first down to me like I'm a 6-year-old?" It's for 6-year-olds. Stop watching it, adults. Either go, don't So's the game by the way. What? You learn the game as well from the game. Yeah, I think that's what also some people counterpoint. Say, I mean, kids have terrible taste. <laughs> have, I mean, have you ever watched uh, Blippy? That guy's a terrorist. It's a strong counter. Never heard like, of this. I, have you ever watched um, like my my son Jack when he was little would just watch garbage trucks like doing their rounds. Oh, we had that too. Like yeah. for an hour. Yeah, that's terrible programming. <laughs> and so they're gonna the kids are gonna say I like this, but it doesn't mean it's any good. I like Connor Orr wrote a hit piece for SI. He did. I love where Connor Orr's head's at right now as a as a writer and as a mm. as a journalist, uh, because he he picks and chooses his hot takes, and it, they come in blue flame, blue flame. Yeah, and he came after uh, big Pixar, and you got to yeah, it's commendable, Greg. You may not agree with him. I definitely don't. One of his worst takes. Like, who is it hurting? <laughs> It's like what? What could? What is the downside to any of this? It's just like a a second screen on an ESPN Plus game. Well, it was a bit of a tougher game to find. <laughs> it's on ESPN Plus that not every single person pays I stand for. With well, that's, the whole, that's the whole point. But that's why I think some people were complaining. Like they they have. But Disney. if you have ESPN Plus, you yeah, have that you game. Have, if you yeah, have you can it. watch the regular game. Watch the game. If you have it, yeah. Like not everyone's. But Toy Story for that. is not available unless you have that. It is a sick, cruel world when yeah. Blippi is a millionaire. I don't even know. I've never heard of Blippi. And I'm, I gotta I'm so happy. Well, it, from another so angle, creating insanely bizarre content for children that will get them obsessed and addicted as an adult is a smart move. A <laughs> twisted, twisted myth of a man. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, by the way, the Jaguars stay in London. They'll be playing at the Hot Toddy against the Bills next week. Let's head to the big bell bottom. Now, now the 49ers up 21 to 16. Look for a two score lead. McCaffrey's already got three touchdowns. They put him into a pistol behind Purdy. This guy is Debo was right. Three or left. They give it to McCaffrey off the left side. One, two, three, (laughs) four. Touchdown! (laughs) CMC! That vision again, Pop. I'm telling you because they had a defender (laughs) in the backfield and CMC puts his right foot in the ground and just popped to the edge. My goodness, Christian McCaffrey. I know they haven't won in a while, the Niners, the big one. But I am 
hot damn, I'm envious of that fan base because it feels like there's a lot of fun to root for this team uh, who, once again, like when we did the Thursday night recap, Mark, um, with their Giants game, it's like they don't even really need to step on the accelerator to take care of business against a lot of these teams in the league, just like they did on Sunday, 35-16 over the Cardinals, who, who did their best to hang around in this game, uh, but ultimately it really was no contest. Brock Purdy, 20 of 21. Uh, with a touchdown passing and a, and a rushing TD. And, yes, Christian McCaffrey, who you may have passed on, on your, in your fantasy draft, um, I think I did maybe twice, uh, had four touchdowns in this game and is really in peak form. Uh, Mark, the Niners, they're in control right now. They, it just it looks so easy. And I, I know that's sort of a staple of the Shanahan offense from, like, the quarterback angle that – uh, you've got these guys running wide open. Um, they're perfectly put together on offense from a skill position angle. We know that. But uh, you have players playing at their very best. Because I think to your point about the fantasy Christian McCaffrey thing is like, when he's there, he's available, he's great. And he's there for five games, and then he's gone for – it's like, you know what you're going to get. He's stayed healthy with them. They use him all over the place. It's the four touchdowns. It's 27 touches for 177 yards. Um, he's scored in 13 straight games for them, which snapped a Jerry Rice record. You've got Brandon Ayuk getting better and better and better every week. Like Debo Samuel, who is a little banged up. Superstar, some people are saying. Heading there. <laughs> I Debo, think he has a chance. Well, I'd get on, I'd get yeah. on that train because I think the chance is occurring right now. I mean, his 148 yards off six catches are like, I mean, it's just like he can do everything. He, he's such an incredible receiver. So strong. And like also it's Brock Purdy making I think we look at Brock Purdy sometimes be like, well, he's accurate, but is he special? Does he have special arm talent? Like he made some really special throws in this game. Mm. Really accurate. And like I my he opened 13 for 13, which which makes sense if you go 20 for 21. Mm. But that also snapped like a to a game in the game consecutive completion streak that Steve Young said. It's like these old heroes are being bested in a more modern-day offensive type situation by this star-riddled offense. And it's like the Cardinals, honestly, like made that, that four touchdowns and the fourth touchdown by McCaffrey mattered because the score looks not as close as it was for part of this. It was another performance where the Cardinals kind of cardinaled and they're well-coached. And, like, you got these guys wondering why are they still hanging around in this game. Um, Michael Wilson, their rookie, I thought he looked great. He's third third round out of Stanford. Like he's someone they have. Josh Dobbs for the fact that he's not the future there probably is like a top two or three backup for the next as many amount of years with the way he's played over the last couple of weeks. So they kind of gave him a test on defense a little bit, but the Niners offense, like at every turn, keep breaking you. And it keeps happening with different people each time. And you've got a quarterback that's come out of nowhere half a season ago and looks incredible. I mean, they only got to five third downs. The 49ers. That's just silly. It's easy. They had 30 first downs. And the, the Cardinals offense, to your point, gave, gave them everything they could handle. It's 21 to 16 going into the fourth. Part of the reason it's close is because these were long drives that the Cardinals are going on. Like, their average per play was pretty solid. They could run the ball. Like, their offense is frisky, but that's why the 49ers are, have been the best team so far is – one of their sides can dominate in a given week or in a given quarter. Any player on either side could dominate. You, it doesn't need to be the same side every time. Brock Purdy, I think, played poorly against the Giants. Definitely not well. Like, I would say that was a... He got away with some throws. It was like yeah. a C yeah. game, and they walked away with it. But then he can come out and play an A game, and the offense walks away with it. Yeah, and I think this this tells the story. And we talked about I think we used the the analogy to swingers about the bear that has these claws in the teeth and he doesn't always know when to use them or he doesn't need to use them. But then when they decide the bear decides to use the claws, bad things happen to the bunny. Once the <laughs> and credit to the Cardinals, 11 plays, 99 drop, 99 yards. Josh Dobbs leads them. And all of a sudden it's 21 16, as we said. And the Niners don't panic. They get the ball back. They go eight for 75. Boom. Touchdown. 28 16. Then they force a punt. Then they go back down the field, 14 for 77, boom, and it's 35-16, good night, nurse. So it's kind of like if you de if you decide to bow up and challenge them, good for you, and it shows that you're a team with a backbone. But when they decide to get serious against these middle-tier te teams and below, it's just a no contest, and that's one of the signs of a truly great team. And I cannot wait to see them against another, in my opinion, great team 
Cowboys. No, I'm with you because it's like, to your point of like, yeah, they were challenged score-wise at one point in this, but their drive chart, and these are long drives, the Niners, touchdown, 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 a one-play end-of-half situation, their only punt, then touchdown, touchdown, game over. That's as that does not happen that often. That is a uh, not a lot of drives. Essentially six six drives, and you scored touchdowns on five of them. That is uh, outrageous. And oh, by the way, like Debo Samuel, you know, barely did anything because he was playing hurt. It's like you get a one catch Kittle game, and you still put up five touchdowns in six drives. Easy, easy, easy. Let's take a break and then finish it out. All right, we're back. Let's head across the sidewalk where the Chargers did battle with the Raiders. And now a first and goal. O'Connell on a fourth and ten completes it. What a game. <laughs> Rolling to his right, throwing to his right, intercepted. Oh. Asante Samuel intercepts it and slides down. DJ, well, he might have been able to take that to the house. Right, no, 230 and change. <laughs> but we'll take the interception. We'll take the take interception. interception, but he could have kept going. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a bit of a unusual tactic to be a cornerback who says, nah, I'm good on the 100 yard <laughs> pick six, even though it actually would have been helpful to the need team. It. Not yeah. even strategically. I think he helpful. thought right. the game, I think he thought there was like 30 seconds left. It just felt like that. It was 2.30 with the there other team having more. timeouts. You know who's going to be really annoyed with himself tonight? Asante Samuel. Yeah. Because that's what you live for. But you know what? He still did make the key play in the game, and that was the great Matt Money Smith on the call, and then some other guy chimed in unnecessarily uh, as the Chargers. Um, get three touchdowns from Justin Herbert, and yes, that huge interception and a beautiful Herbert deep ball to ice this thing because they did need to hit a third and long after the Samuel step out to actually run out the clock, and they did, uh, beating the Raiders 24-17. A bizarre game uh, in which, you know, only the Chargers, like Khalil Mack had six sacks in this game in like the end of the third quarter. What? Uh, one sack away from uh, Derek Thomas, and Whoa. they still almost lost the game. Uh, and that's what the Chargers do. And yet, here we are, Greg. What? What? Okay. What? What? <laughs> what? What? I can't do it live anywhere. I don't want to hear it on, the, on that. Uh, missing Mike Williams, Austin Eckler, Derwin James. Am I missing somebody? These are Joey Bosa. Joey yeah, Bosa. Like all I all, am missing all somebody. Uh, I don't care. And I know Aiden O'Connell is playing in this game, not Jimmy Garoppolo. But a good win for the Chargers, who are uh, finding a way two weeks in a row after finding a way to give it away in their first two weeks. Yeah, take care of business game that you make interesting despite having a 24-7 to halftime lead because you are the Chargers. But I got to give Staley credit, I guess, for just sticking to his guns with the fourth down decision. Uh, late in the game, they decide to go for it. On fourth and one, I think it was on their own 34, Dan, was mm -hmm. it? With 3.30 to go, and they're up by a touchdown. And it's not like last week where they're going against Kirk Cousins. They're going against Aiden O'Connell. And a first down doesn't quite win the game, but it gets you pretty close to it. And they go for fourth down and one again on their own 34. And they set up Aiden O'Connell. Uh, to do it. maybe it's Staley is is uh, playing chess. It's definitely here. not. He's it's, not playing chess. He's letting his defense, which has gotten all this grief, be the heroes every week. But How here's the that? thing: like, <laughs> is this, this is the QB sneak. Justin Herbert threw an interception in this game, and he went to make a tackle. And please don't do this, star quarterbacks. Just get out of the way. And he gets, I think, and we'll learn more about it. But I think he gets his. It's pretty gnarly. He gets his finger, I believe. Um, uh, Eric Roberts, our producer, knows all about these gnarly finger injuries caught in the face mask or the ear hole or something. And it, it does damage to his non-throwing hand, maybe his middle finger or his ring finger. So to me, it was a crazy play call. If you're going to go for it there and you don't have Austin Eckler and your franchise quarterback has a splint and all sorts of like gauze around one of his fingers and he's at a shotgun to the point where you're kneeling at the end of the game at a shotgun. Like, I don't know if I'm running a QB sneak there. I If I don't have something in my bag that doesn't involve Justin Herbert with a, a gnarly mangled finger trying to get a yard, I'm not calling that play. But this is the beauty of the Brandon Staley experience. You know, and if you, the if madness you, of it all. Yeah, if you look back last year, I mean, 
there were real questions if Herbert should have been in that game after he banged up his ribs and all that business. It's like they kept him in that situation too. Let's hear from Brandon Staley who said Herbert was not coming out of this game. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't coming out. It was one of those things where he was going back in and he has that look, I'm going back in, I'm good. And, um, you know, again, just to show that toughness to the team, we really talked about that going into this game, being a division game, uh, and he surely showed it. And when your franchise quarterback, you know, embodies all that, you know, everyone else jumps along. Mm. He said after the game, Herbert, that it was just a, fl- it was but a flesh wound. Little ref, little, uh, that? little ref. And then they were like, was it actually just a flesh wound? He was like, no, that was just using the quote. I mean, it... <laughs> What it, was it? Like what? Well, it is looked it? like it was like severe, like maybe severely jammed, or we don't know at this point. But like he had the splint on the finger initially, like w- with what was like a mummy's hand and wrapped towels, and then he came out like the next drive with the splint hanging around like a glove. And That's so it's, without, it, like a it way too to big look glove. Really weird. Yeah. They're like, hey, Donald Parham, six foot seven tight end. Can we borrow your glove? Like he had this strange right. glove that yeah. had way too much end on it. Meanwhile, like yeah, you know, the Raiders starting Ado O'Connell. At least they made the right decision there. I would have been killing them if they had started Brian Hoyer. Did we see anything out of uh, Mr. O'Connell? Did? No, he looked very much like a young quarterback. And Josh McDaniels, I mean, he had they had first and goal uh, in the before the Samuel interception, and he forces a ball that it's just a terrible pass uh, where he didn't read the defense the way he needed to in a, a huge spot in the game. He, he's not protecting the football, so I, you know, that I, I would actually like to watch, kind of watch it again on game pass just to see O'Connell's uh, performance again. But I didn't come out of it thinking, and maybe this is what Josh McDaniels wants, uh, to see enough where he could roll with this kid and start developing someone other than Garoppolo. Uh, But ultimately, he he made too many mistakes for them to win a game on the road. This is the second week in a row, and I'm I'm searching and trying to figure out beyond his coordinator pedigree under Bill Belichick with the Patriots what makes Josh McDaniels special versus the opposite of special. And what we saw last week, crazy decision. This time around, he does not challenge what would have been absolutely called a touchdown. And it's like you lost this game by a touchdown with a Devontae Adams thing. And, like, why not? Well, they scored. They scored on that drive. I know they did. I know they did. I know they did. So, but here's the thing. Like, what is the process in that situation? Like, you have to go to the number one best player on your team and say, you know you scored? I'll challenge it. Why isn't someone up in the... Booth saying absolutely challenges. Every one of us watching it knew it was a touchdown, and he doesn't take the time to make the correct decision. They scored, but it's like another example of, like, what are we doing here? And uh, we also found out this weekend that Chandler Jones is no longer with the Raiders, uh, which was... I did not see that. I saw he got arrested. (laughs) Yeah, like, uh, this is all a sad story, and we don't know what it's going to mean for the rest of his career, but, yeah, he was... Uh, arrested after violating a domestic violence temporary protective order. And then later on Friday night, a little bit of a news dump, they they cut him. Mm. And just everything that you've seen through social media and stuff, if you've ever had someone around you that's suffered like a mental breakdown, which uh, I don't know, it, it's consistent with that sort of behavior. And it's just it's it's tough to see, but his career is going to be changed and they're going to go after his money now. So they can say that they're all praying for him, which is what they said in their statement, but it's, you know, lawyers are getting involved now and they're going to try to take away his money. And and, and it's a it's business. Ugly. Yeah. And that's, it's sometimes it's an ugly business. And yeah, that I want to give a little credit before we move on to the Raiders defense, uh, because you held Justin Herbert to 167 yards passing. He hit mm-hmm. on the big throw, a uh, 20 yard throw to ice the game. But before that, the Chargers had a less than 100 yards of total offense uh, in the final two quarters of that game, which allowed the Raiders to get back into it. And if not for the interception, I think this was one of those games that was going to overtime. And then who knows what happens? And yet it did not. <laughs> it's four straight insane Chargers games. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. They just played a script so much. Like all four of their games this season have been totally bonkers. 44 straight. I mean, they're entertaining as long as you're not a Chargers fan. Because the, the anxiety of it all is off the charts. All right. The Saints, uh, they were supposed to play without Derek Carr in, uh, on Sunday. Derek Carr plays uh, with a jacked up shoulder, and it did not go well for the QB or his team. Third down and goal from the five. Drop play, draw play. Dropping Baker Mayfield. Looking to his left. Now back to his right. Looking over the middle. Look at Looking all that the time. Where is the pass the rush? The end zone. It's a diving oh, catch what a catch. right at the goal line. 
It's going to be a touchdown, Tampa Bay. What touchdown, play Tampa by... Bay. And Devin Tompkins has the catch wow. right at the goal line. Love it. Jane Dagger off. With the call, WFUS. Baker's back, baby. Oh, three touchdown passes for the Bucks, And despite, yes, a surprise return for Derek Carr, the Saints offense did nothing in Alvin Kamara's debut. 26-9. The Bucks win on the road. Mark, Baker was back in this one. Good Baker, 25 of 32, 246. What, I mean, how does Carr, and we know Carr is a tough dude, but you got to you gotta know when not to play. Like, did he look like a guy with a sprained AC joint? Like, how do you play with that and be effective? I, that surprised me. I give me. him, like, a lot of credit for, for going out there, and it, it surprised me that he was, just like you, and, like, uh, the whole offense looked completely unhinged. I mean, he no, he did look affected. It's not the same way that I watched Burrow and feel that I'm seeing the physical effect. Um, it wasn't like he was wincing in pain left and right. But to your point, because we talked about this before, one of the weirdest stats in this game is like Alvin, McCar- Alvin Kamara had 13 catches for 33 yards. They had nothing going on through the what? air. <laughs> Hit me with another rosy. Wow, wow, wow. What? <laughs> Wait, say that sad again. What? what did you do? What? 13 what? catches for what? 33 what? yards. That's not. No, you got. This is a professional podcast. You got to get the stats right, Mark. <laughs> that's exactly. What did he actually what, have? 133? Uh, no. Like that. That is. That's exactly what happened. And they like Chris Olave. <laughs> PPR, 33. Chris Olave. Demon. <laughs> he had one. Ca- Chris Olave had one catch for four yards. They just. It was. It was a terrible performance. I give a lot of the credit, though. To the Bucks defense, uh, guys like Vita Vea with two sacks today, Shaq Barrett shutting down the run, Antoine Winfield had a really nice third down breakup. They kept ending drives, card 50 yards at half. This like we keep seeing this every week. They're saying, and you get Baker Mayfield playing. I was trying to think like what game has he played where he looked better to me, and I can think of maybe the playoff win over the Steelers with Cleveland. A couple of his early performances, like in 2018, when he was like no one knew about that he, Rams game a couple uh, last. There's that. That was <laughs> that. That was like so he'll yeah. do this when he's good. He's like seeing the field really well, and like that play right there. It's like he could have forced the throw earlier. He had a lot of time to throw in the replay that we came in with, and made a really spot on throw. And I thought that he used today, and he's been doing this week after week. Two big down, big third down conversions with his legs. And then he had another one where he had a run that basically set up a field goal that put them up 17 to 6 and kind of separated this game. And that's when it started to end for them. And I just think, like, you know, Mike Evans left in the, before, that, before the third quarter uh, with a hamstring injury. Oh, you no. take out the one weapon that, like, he's really, like, been in chemistry with. And it didn't really seem to change much. He just found new guys. And I don't know. If this is the Baker you get, they're alone atop the NFC South at 3 and 1. Um, I don't know if I can take them for real, but they outclass uh, the Saints. It's a great when sign. When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. It's a great sign that Baker had his t- come down to earth game on Monday night, and then it didn't spiral, and then Baker disappeared for like right. And even wasn't wasn't a crazy bad right. game. It just was yeah. Like it wasn't boring. brutal by any stretch. And let's listen. We've seen enough that that's coming. There will be times where he does have uh, funks, but. Maybe, just maybe, he's in the right division with the right schedule where there's going to be more good than bad this season well, with this guy. I, I thought all offseason that the Saints were trying to genetically engineer the roster to win this division, like 9-8, and 10-7, and seven, like have a defense that can, you know, be special enough against these offenses. Right. But that's maybe, Tampa. But yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. The Bucs are, yeah. are kind of taking that, and that's why I said at the beginning of the show, I'm always wary of the defense first teams because Saints fans were convinced this defense was special, and in 2023, in the end, like your defense probably isn't that special. Like it's solid. It's going to be solid, but it's not going to be special enough. It's going to come down to your offense and their offense with Derek Carr looks a lot like their offense with Andy Dalton. In fact, it's worse in in a lot of ways because of their offensive line. And I know Carr's injury was a a big factor here. He had 3.4 yards per attempt. They said it wasn't after the game, but probably probably was, but their offensive line has been a mess all four weeks and the passing game has been disjointed all four weeks, like before cards injury too. So I, I don't think you can just put it only on the car injury. All right, let's head to the, uh, a pair of loser goes home matches, starting with a showdown uh, between the Vikings and Panthers in Charlotte. Two receivers left, Adam Thielen, the outside receiver, now joined by another. So three left and one to the right. Bryce Young facing a blitzing Harrison Look out. Smith. And the ball Come came out, him. Come and it's picked up by D.J. Wadham. Wow. It is loose! 
DJ Wadhams' first National Football League touchdown has tied the game at 13. Woo. Best in the business, Paul Allen, KFAN. Yeah, you know, it's a bit of a cliche in the business, but sometimes National Football League just hits harder than NFL. <laughs> You're right. Harrison Smith had three sacks, including that sack that set up uh, the scoop and score by DJ Wanham and the Vikings <clears throat> overcome a slow start to beat the Panthers 21-13. Their first win of the season, the Panthers 0-4. And, and my goodness, Mark Sessler, you had previously on the Thursday show locked up the Saints to take care of Baker. Right, for about 12 minutes. Very wise. You pivot out to the Vikings. I pivot out to the Vikings. The West Brothers pivot in. To the Vikings, mm. and we all go home happy. That's the big story of this. Oh, that's game. right. Your uh, your lock would have been off. I had a double run. No, I had a double win. I had a double win. Yeah, I mean, when you can lock up an 0 and 3 team on the road, you've got to do it, and that's what we did. And uh, it looked really. <laughs> I locked shaky. up two 0 and 3 teams in a way, and got two dubs out of it. That's that's how history will remember me. Give yeah. it to us. <laughs> it it was shaky though. I I was really concerned about for all of us early on. Like you yes. got this version of Kirk Cousins, and there have been a lot of turnovers. No Kirk. That whole offense. Right out of the gate on the first drive, third and goal, bad pass. No. Sam Franklin jumps the route, goes 99 yards for a pick six. No. Um, Cousins had another bad pick later that set up a big, long field goal before half for the Panthers. So it was like, when is this Vikings offense? The reason I picked them was because, like, even in these losses, they've been productive. And Justin Jefferson had a big game today, but it took them a while to get out of it. But the Harrison Smith thing, and I'm glad that he was, like, on that replay because Harrison Smith – showed me a lot about Bryce Young, who I think is struggling to see the field. He's behind a bad offensive line. But in two of his three sacks, he came out of nowhere with a certain type of speed that I think at the college level, Bryce Young escapes and makes a play. And not here, not here. And it's just like, I, like we've talked about two other rookie quarterbacks that are vying for offensive rookie of the year. And I don't love what's around Bryce Young right now. Um, he'll make a play here and there, but it's just like we're four weeks in and I'm not really seeing it. I'm just not really seeing it. Like their offense, they got a good performance by a defense that basically set up 10 points for them. And that's a lot for like a defense that's pretty banged up. And Bryce Young and the offense could do nothing with it. There was a really big chance in this game with 7.20 to go in the fourth quarter. They're down 21 to 13, the Panthers. And Bryce Young had a chance to drive them and make a couple of plays here and there. But he, and by the way, he was 16 for 16 in the second half. And when that stat popped hey. up, I was like, wait, what? It doesn't look like it to me at all. It just didn't look like it to me at all. Um, he Why? Just because there's just a lot of check downs? It, yeah, it's just not big, big throws. Because they also went punt, catastrophic fumble, three and out, negative nine, and then punt. Oh, right. They had 121 right. yards after but that. But Harrison yeah. Ford, <laughs> or Harrison Ford, Harrison Smith was a huge reason for that. They're in the In the pass rush of the Vikings in general, which... Under Brian Flores, I know they were the worst defense in the league last year. They're certainly just responding to his teaching and who he is. And they made tight, like life really tough for Bryce Young. I, I'm a, be a little concerned about the journey of the rookie season at this point. Uh, and I think, Greg, you made the point earlier, like, yes, progress for the defense. But, again, the opponent really helps make defenses look better as well. And Carolina just doesn't seem like it's happening right now. Frank Reich had a kind of a sad post-game press conference where – he said, you know, I know we're the team with the first round, first overall pick, but we're not, we don't view ourselves as this like big project. We want to have results now. And yet they're 0 4, and, and obviously they're deep into a rebuild now. Well, he's sick of taking L's. I mean, yeah, there's been it, a lot. He lost a bunch of straight games before getting fired in Indianapolis, and now four straight here. And, I think you heard on the Paul Allen call, that was the sound of an announcer who's also a big Vikings fan who wants his team to be relevant, feeling like, oh, that is a season-saving play maybe by Wanham because their offense isn't getting anything done. Their defense scored a touchdown. Now our defense answered, and it would have been lights out for the Vikings at 0-4, and, and who knows what happens from here, but at least he got a little life at one. All right, uh, let's head to the other uh, loser-goes-home match. 31-28 Denver. Third and 13 Bears from the Chicago 47. 38 seconds to go. No timeouts. Three to the left. Single receiver right. 
Fields tries to draw the Broncos off sides. They bring the house. Fields in the pocket. Throws a ball that is incomplete. Oh, it's intercepted. Ooh. Intercepted Kareem Jackson. Yes. And this one is going to be the Broncos' first win of the year. Denver only has two interceptions in four games. Kareem has both of them. But this one is huge because it has sealed the Broncos' first victory of the year. That's Dave Logan on the call for KOA. Justin Fields started out incredibly on Sunday uh, with the, one of the best first halves you'll see really ever uh, in dominating, getting the Bears out to a huge lead over the Broncos. But to Denver's credit, uh, they came roaring back in uh, the second half, outscoring Chicago 24-7, to and they steal it 31-28 at a soldier field that sounded like a a, a tomb there. Well, they were frothily booing the hell out of Matt Eberflus for some fourth down decisions. And then certainly as the game ended, the shot of Fields just staring blankly on the bench while the boos were just cascading down was, was tough to take because it was it was such a bad luck game for him. He played so well. It wasn't even a perfect first half. It was a perfect three quarters at the mm. end of three quarters. He was 23 for 24 for 285 yards in four touchdowns. That one incompletion <laughs> was a Hail Mary attempt. And and Hello. I know and I know people say, well, it was the Broncos, the Broncos are disasters. And I get it, but there were some absolute dimes in this game by him on against the Blitz under pressure. There was him going through reads and getting the ball out on time. He really was really impressive and then the bears defense shows up and i put this a little more on eber in the defense it's 28 to 7 at that point they gave up a long touchdown drive uh the bears finally don't have a, a good drive they go three and out but you know it, it happens they give up another long touchdown drive then then fields has it you want to settle the day, game down and this is where your heart started to break for him his next two possessions were he holds on to the ball too long kind of a classic fields thing jonathan cooper his friend who he ex- was going to exchange jerseys with after the game. I think they were roommates. Sack fumble. They return it 35 yards to tie. Cooper returns it as well. Cooper returns it. Yikes. And then it's like, okay, man, everything's on you right now. He goes, uh, you know, can you answer it? You go on this long drive. You get all the way down the field in scoring position to take the lead. And Uberflus, instead of kicking the field goal to take the lead, would have been, I think, about a 40-yard or pretty short, 42 Decides to go for it on fourth down. Oh, It's not Fields who had a great drive. He hands it off. They get stuffed. Broncos tack on a field goal. And then on the final drive for Fields, that it's that interception where Cole Komet said after the game it was a miscommunication where they were thinking one guy was going to run the route. And it was just like, man, you feel for this dude. After such a great start to have the, a total disaster of an ending. And credit the Broncos and uh, Sean Payton. Uh, they're down 28-7 late in the third quarter, and and they are the laughing stock of the league after a 70-20 last week. So there's obviously some fight in that uh, in that uh, on that roster to be able to do what they did here, I, uh, Greg, and, right. and I don't know if Russell Wilson did he did he ball out here late in this game? How did they manage to pull off a very unlikely comeback? It, he played well, making short throws, and Jaleel McLaughlin is a player. I don't I don't know what his size is, but. Yeah, he can move. Like he had seven catch, seven rushes for seventy-two yards. I think they're afraid of using him too much because he's so small. And three catches for thirty-two yards. There was a lot of run after the catch. Like not many big plays. Mims had his like weekly big play. But yeah, their offense has been pretty efficient in general. Nothing that blows your socks. Wilson's out. The box score is stellar. I mean, yeah, it looks yeah. good. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was good. just look at his counting numbers this year. He's having a good year. Yeah, it's not exactly like he's not old Russ, but he's like we said on Thursday, not the problem. If they had a good defense, their offense is playing well enough to win. They lost Javante Williams to a hip injury in this game pretty early. That's partly why McLaughlin uh, ended up playing so much. But the way it ended, it just did still feel like Bears were the story because you had Eberflus answering questions about Chase Claypool, who was a healthy scratch. And he was saying... Take a walk, Claypool. He Maybe. was saying that he, that it was Claypool's decision to stay home. He didn't show up for the game. But then the team released a statement <laughs> that yeah. was counter to what Eberflus said, that they actually told him to stay home. And my read of the situation is they're trying to trade him and they're trying to not make him look like 
a bad guy, but it's like too late. You're you, too many bear statements this year that go against what yeah. got it is. It's a weekly drama, and they and he he's the second player to publicly critique the coaching. And like I guess my thing is you've got this young general manager that is here to rebuild the team. It's obviously a dis- looking not going well right now. He picked Eberflus, but in any other environment, I wouldn't be surprised if like Eberflus was dismissed like tomorrow. Like this has gone mm. about as poorly as possible. I don't know who you'd replace. But I him think with. he was a healthy scratch because he criticized the. But offense. I don't. But I don't mean he had like no the, idea. I don't mean the yeah. Claypool thing. It's like the fourth down decision today. But overall, the Eberflus yeah. experiment. That's what I said last has week. Has been terrible. Greg had pointed out. Well, they also just had a part ways with their DC. So who is even the guy that goes into that spot? It's, and you kind of need that. It's not great. Yeah. None of it's great. Um. All right. Okay. One more game. Sunday Night Football. McKinnon is the running back to the right of Mahomes on third down and eight. Now they flare him out. They're going to throw it here. McKin- or Mahomes steps up. He's at the 10, angling at the 5. Mahomes goes down at the 2, sliding on his hip McKinnon style like Super Bowl 57 as Mahomes goes down at the 2 and should affect in the game, gaining 9 yards on third down and 8. The call from Mitch Holtis. Chiefs Radio. I'm going to be professional here or do my best because that should not have ever happened. Okay. Because uh, minutes earlier, third and 20, a generous holding call on Sauce Gardner kept a Chiefs drive alive that ended with Mahomes' slide there for the first down that allowed the Chiefs to run out the rest of the clock and edge the New York Jets 23-20 at the Meadowlands in front of Taylor Swift and the world. Um, The Chiefs jumped out to a 17-0 lead after the first quarter. Uh, The Jets came roaring back behind surprisingly sound play uh, from Zach Wilson, Uh, but the Jets' offense petered out in the second half after an opening touchdown, and the Chiefs uh, made the big plays down the stretch and, yes, got some big calls as well. Yeah, that call was unfortunate because he wanted to see Zach Wilson who had played an up and down game, but there were definitely ups. There were more ups than, than we've seen out of him in a long time. You wanted to see him down six, get that chance in a big spot. Their defense had been holding the fort so well after it was 17, nothing. Uh, but after they do make that penalty, it's just like, how many times am I going to see Patrick Mahomes win the win a game with his legs? They showed, I think he had rushed for 11 first downs before those last two. That was before he ran for the, third and 23, 25 yard play. Right. And and that's the one that's going to stick with me a little bit. Cause it reminded you so much of the super bowl and he ends up sliding down on that play where there was also a penalty uh, by the jets to pick up 25 yards. And it's just like, if he doesn't kill you one way, he's going to kill you another, even on a night where he made some big mistakes. It, they referenced the super bowl. And it's like, I go back to the James Bradbury defensive holding call. That was so pivotal in that game last February. And Mahomes on his feet and just thought the Jets defense, this is kind of like everything you would have hoped for from the Jets for five, six of the way when you lost Aaron Rodgers, that Zach Wilson would start to become this guy. And like there was one hopeful thing I thought at the end of this, that all his teammates were coming up to him and they recognized the effort put it in that fumble. That was like the one little Zach Wilson-esque thing yes. that, that, that took away from a really superb night and what could have just been like these games come down to these one, these little moments and this should have had a, it it just feel like it should have been a completely different story, but you are dealing with the chiefs who in that final quarter ate up seven minutes and 23 seconds on a field goal drive and then seven minutes and 24 seconds to end the game on that final Mm. flag ridden March. And it's like, that's what they do. That's what they do in these games. And it's like, they made, they made Mahomes uncomfortable early in this game. He threw one of his worst interceptions and like Travis Kelsey vanished for 33 minutes. It was all there until that, until that holding call. So at the end of the game, in the final seconds after the Mahomes slide, Robert Sala gets um, flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct. And then they run the rest of the clock. And I kind of wish we can hear his press conference right now um, because I understand why he's so hot. This has been a extremely, extremely heartbreaking season for everyone associated with the Jets, with everything that happened with Rodgers, even though Aaron Rodgers is in the building and he's telling Melissa Stark he plans to be back this season. But you're one and three, and one and three is what it is, and you're in a lot of trouble right now. 
uh, with some more tough games coming up on your schedule after Denver next week. Um, but the reason he's so fired up and so upset, first of all, yes, was there contact on that play, the third and 20 with Sauce? Yeah, there was some contact, but it was both ways. It is definitely not a, a, a – does not, to me, rise to the level of taking the flag out and make a game-changing – oh, by the way, the result of that play was an interception by Patrick Mahomes. So not only do you uh, wave off a third and 20 and turn it into a first down, you wave off Patrick Mahomes' third interception that sets up the Jets with the ball with, I guess, what, about three minutes to play I've down I've got a three. theory on that. He threw the flag so late, it almost was like he saw it. He wasn't maybe going to call it. Then there's an interception, and he's like, well, I guess I better call it. There was, And maybe that is, listen. Wow. Which, I, it, which actually I like isn't. my job. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and say that the Jets got boned because Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes and the refs have to watch out for Mahomes. Uh, although I don't a lot mean of any Jets conspiracy fans feel that theory. way. I mean, to say that that impacted the interception, which it, it did on some level. But should they have called it? I don't know. Um, but yeah, the reason why Sal is probably going to get fined in his postgame presser on top of what happened in the end is because he knows what it took for this team to be down 17, nothing to fight back the way they did to be kind of kicked and spit on after everything that's gone down and feel like you have a chance to like save your season. And it felt like it got ripped out of their, their hands. Now I'll say this as terrible as that ending was an anticlimactic and we know what Zach Wilson is and what he's not the chances that he goes down the field and wins that game very slim however it would have been fun to see what would have happened like that and that's what you kind of you lose in this game but the Jets had when the game got to 2020 after they get the touchdown and the two-point conversion on a great drive by Wilson where he made some big throws and then a great scramble on the two-point conversion they had the ball twice um, once near, near midfield after, a, I believe, a Mahomes pick uh, and did nothing with, with it. And then again, after a long Brees Hall run, set them up in Chiefs territory, 2020, they then go one, two, three, and punt. And that was really it for their opportunities to win this game. So it was there for them uh, beyond um, what you might kind of take out of this game. And they just weren't ready to step up and grab it. And that's frustrating as well. There are these like little moments, like the Brees Hall run, which to me looked like this is going to be a touchdown run and change this thing. And there was a great tackle by Brian Cook, A-plus tackle. I mean, this is the kind of game where if the Jets were at a different point in their season and had a better record, you could be like, this is positive. We can take a lot away from it. But it's like, what else needs to happen to this organization and this team this season? Like, it was a back-breaking kind of loss that, like, I, I, I wish I could see Zach Wilson in a final drive because the way he threw the ball to, like, Alan Lazard tonight and others, like, some of his throws... We just haven't seen that from Zach Wilson on a consistent basis. He played his best game, and maybe it would have been a different story. It, it was good pass protection, I thought, from the Jets, and maybe that's why they were so tempted to go so pass-heavy. But the better running team won the ball. I When you were talking about Pacheco, I'm thinking, the Chiefs don't win this game without Pacheco. Not just the long touchdown, but the way he was breaking tackles, how he can grind down uh, defenses late in clock like the Chiefs haven't always had that and they were absolutely the like tougher better running team and when they had the ball the Jets those two times um to potentially go ahead when the defense is just flying at that point they're getting stop after stop on step after stop on the homes they went really passive it was basically pass every single down maybe one Dalvin Cook run in there for a couple of yards and that that's a lot to put on Zach Wilson to me it's like they need to have a running game and a defense tonight. They had a defense was good enough and you got an improved Zach Wilson. I think he's slowly getting better. That gives you a little the hope. offensive he, line has right. been a lot better. Um, right. Well, last you got to run was too. better run too. the pass protection. I thought was excellent uh, for much of this game, uh, which, you know, the quarterback playing well when the pass protection better, there's a correlation there. My last thoughts on this game uh, that again, extremely frustrating because you, you find a way to steal this game. And your season just feels totally different. And you got Denver coming up. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, maybe you're like, hmm, okay, we, maybe we can hang around. And then the Rodgers talk. And it, it still feels something like there's something here. One and three feels totally different. But I'm just like, as a Jets fan, I'm, I talked about it all week. I felt really ominous vibes about this game. And I thought it was going to be an utter humiliation for the fan base, and I felt really bad. I told my brother not to go to the game. And it was 17 nothing. He did right. go to the game. This is 17 nothing in the first quarter very quickly. Um, and the fact that they fought back, made it a game, had some, a lot of energy in that building, it's, it's a small victory for me. But just the fact that they were not 
horrifically embarrassed in prime time, and it wasn't just this Taylor Swift and the Jets are fun suck. Isn't that funny? I'll take a little bit of a W there, but that's the only one I can take. I hate how the game ended, and and that's it. I can't say much more. The only thing I'd say, like, I don't need to say much more. That's it. One little like, ray of hope is that <laughs> this is like a two year journey with Aaron Rodgers, and in, in this whole coming back this season, we'll see. But it's like it's important that this team stays together and like doesn't completely sail away, and that the coaching staff shows who they can be. And this game result frustrating as can be, um, but it's the kind of thing by like Thursday or Friday, you can take some positives from it. There is a lot, there's a long way to go. And like, I see a team that has not given up on their coach. I agree. Well, we'll see what happens. A lot of football left. A lot of season left. Good uh, stuff today. Sunday. Thank you to uh, Eric and Randy behind the glass. Thank you to you, the listener. Monday, we'll have our NFL Plus uh, game of the week. And another podcast tomorrow night, Monday Night Football and News Catch-Up. Till then, heed the call.